Hello there. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So yeah, this is my teddy bear. <laughs> Welcome to Pajamas Gone. You can see that I'm in bed. I am in my pajamas with my teddy bear. And um, yeah, so uh, hello, hello. Let me see if there's any comments. Can you hear me all right? Yes? Yeah, so yeah, we have people from Italy. We have people from Germany, Norway. Welcome, hello. I'm so glad that everybody is here. And um, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. So yeah, welcome to Pajamas Golf. And um, so I will just share my screen and then do a little presentation as an opening. So um, yeah, uh, oops, this is not the first slide. Uh, let me adjust it, sorry about that. Yeah, this is like a last minute slice thing. Yeah, so it should be like this one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, welcome, welcome to Pajamas Con 2020. Have you got your pajamas ready, like me? Uh, I'm in my dressing gown, by the way. It doesn't look as good as what I want, but uh, it will do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, let me. Yeah, my laptop is uh, a little bit difficult to drive, but that's fine. So. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, tell you what the Hackeroni is by Thomas Kohn, um, since you're here. Um, so, the uh, story started uh, in 2019, before all the COVID craziness started. So, um, I was in a conference, I can't remember which one, but I was with a bunch of friends. And Dan, we were talking about um, waking up super early uh, <laughs> uh, to catch the conference opening, to catch the coffee, to go to the venue and everything. So we was like, oh, it would be good if there's a conference that we can do it uh, in bed, <laughs> right? So. That's why we have these ideas of Pajamas Conf. Uh, I don't know who come up with the name Pajamas, but uh, I think, yeah, someone told me in Spanish it's, it's a bit weird, but well, at least we have the PY there, so everything, you know, the Python community, we love everything with the letter PY in there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, right, so uh, that's how the idea came up. And uh, last year, actually, um, one of the friends in the discussion, uh, he is Brazilian, and he bring back this idea to um, to Brazil. So actually, Pajamas Con started last year. It was in Brazil. It's uh, very localized, I would say, and the community there is amazing. I can't say enough of how amazing they are. Um, but, you know, since this year, uh, everybody is online. So, um, and I think that we should, go bigger than ever, so uh, we should get global. So um, yeah, so that's how, like that's why we want to do it this year as global as possible. We have uh, added a lot of team members to help. Um, so yeah, you can still see the talk uh, last year uh, in the YouTube channel. Uh, some of you may already see it. Um, so yeah, uh, they're, they're amazing talks. And if you speak Portuguese, please check those out. Um, and of course, uh, this year we, uh, yeah, amazing. Like we sold 800 plus tickets. Uh, I think I got a message this morning saying 840 something, 45 or something. And it's, sorry, my teddy bear need to go for a bit. <laughs> so yeah, it's still growing. Uh, we are still selling tickets. So if you have friends who uh, want to join, uh, they can still register a ticket online. So you can still tell your friends, uh, tell everyone that, uh, you know, that you are joining this conference. If you like it, please share with everyone. Uh, tweet it on Twitter. I uh, use the hashtag pajamasconf2020. I should put it here, but I forgot. And great applause to everyone. Without you, it won't happen. Um, so, housekeeping information, you need to know. Uh, if you join the stream, you are not familiar. First of all, if you're a ticket holder, if you have registered a ticket, you should get an email from us that uh, you can join the Discord channel for networking, discussion, and making new friends. So uh, you will miss out a lot if you don't do it. So please check the email and join our Discord channel. Um, also, we have five stream in total. You are now in stream one. And uh, every stream is separated by a 30 minutes technical break. Uh, we 
Well, we want to run the conference for 24 hours nonstop because of the Koreans. We have to break it into five streams. That's easier for us to manage. Um, so uh, I've put all the streams in a playlist. So if you're watching from a playlist, it's almost like a marathon. It was nonstop, like keep playing, keep playing. <laughs> um, but if you're lost, uh, make sure that you uh, check on the, the, the current stream on, um, if you're like, well, anyway, follow our YouTube channel. Uh, you should get a notification when we are live. And then, um, so yeah, uh, you just catch the, the live stream at the moment. So yeah, just so you know that in between those, you have to switch the stream to keep watching. Um, yeah, and the schedule is on our website, pajamas.live. So uh, you can check out the schedule there, see if there's anything interesting there that you want to see. Um, one thing that I would highly recommend is uh, we have a panel session at 2 p.m. UTC today. So it will be in the second stream. Um, so uh, we will have uh, Tanya Allard and uh, Mark Smith. So both of them are one, one of our speakers and they are amazing speakers. Uh, I know them for, for a while now. Uh, they are very experienced. They are very well known in the Python community. Um, so if you are new to the community, you have questions, you, they are the best person. You can ask them questions. So come in in the panel session and um, you can join the chat and then ask questions there. Um, so uh, of course, everybody is expected to follow the code of conduct, which the link of the code of conduct is in the welcome page, a uh, welcome channel in the Discord. So please uh, just spend a few minutes have a look. Um, and also it's on our website. So make sure that uh, you know, uh, in general, uh, you know, too long, don't read. Be nice to people, uh, respect people, because I want everybody to feel comfy, not just some people to feel comfy. So, yeah. I uh, Also, one extra little thing, you're welcome to put your pronoun in your um, your nickname in Discord. Well, you can change your nickname on Discord. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, you can ask in the general uh, chat. So uh, people there will be able to help you. Um, so yeah, uh, you can add your pronoun there uh, just to make people, uh, you know, less confused and, you know, like uh, they know which is the right pronoun that they can address you. Um, other thing is that if, if unfortunately, I hope it doesn't happen, uh, you have something regarding the code of conduct you have to report to us, you need to find our help. Uh, we will have one uh, code of conduct member on duty uh, anytime on Discord and we'll um, announce who is uh, on duty at the Code of Conduct channel. Um, if you have anything that you want them to know, uh, you can private message them. Uh, we recommend people private message the Code of Conduct member because uh, we want to settle the issues, um, you know, in a professional way. So please contact them privately. Um, so last thing, wear your pajamas, stay at home, relax and have fun. Uh, a few things. Uh, that I want to uh, address before we end this uh, presentation is that, um, yeah, great thank you for our Kashmir sponsor, uh, Microsoft. Uh, without them, you know, because uh, as you may know, that this conference is free. Uh, everybody can get a ticket for free. You're welcome to donate, of course. But uh, since we have the sponsor, um, our expenses is covered by the sponsor, and um, all your donation actually will go to help. Uh, Python community. Um, so we are not sending any of your donation. We're just putting your donation in good use to support the Python community. So uh, please, uh, if you haven't registered a ticket yet, if you're considering registering a ticket, you can also consider donating. Um, last, uh, also thank you for our community partners, Python Island, uh, um, giving us lots of support without them this won't happen and also python discord they are super friendly with us they help us promote and i think it's a really good community to join so um if you join us on discord you can also find the python discord and join them as well so they are a bigger community they also grow so um yeah so after the conference you still have some support from the community uh, from python discord so i would highly recommend anybody to join and also our teams of these are the organizers but these are not all the organizers they're organizers who didn't put their face at our web page um so shout out to everyone you will see on discord that the organizers will have a purple-ish kind of a name bash there so if you see them i'd be nice to them you can say thank to them and also 
the volunteers uh, we have a lot of volunteers who come in to help in the last week or so and really thank them because without them we would be you know having so much pressure and agree to help even at a very short period of time so thank you to them as well they are the per people uh, on discord with the yellow badge so be nice to them again like thank them if you uh, if you want to if you came across them and they're helping you um and last thank you you all and um uh, i think th this is like a conference that you know it won't be a conference if we don't have any participants so thank you thank you for all of you to join me here um so yeah i think that's that's all for my presentation and I will stop sharing and come back in a second. So yeah, that's it for me. And um, so let me see if any of you have any questions regarding the conference, you feel free to ask right now. Our first talk will start uh, at half age for me for in UTC, which is like in, um, in 18 minutes from now. Um, so yeah, uh, say keep saying hi on the stream. It will still be streaming. And uh, if you have questions, type in the chat and I will answer your questions. Um, yeah, so I would uh, make sure you grab your drink choice. It could be a um, coffee or uh, if you're not a morning person, you can drink a hot chocolate <laughs> and sit back and relax and uh, and I have my teddy bear. <laughs> how how often do you see a conference start with someone in bed and holding a teddy bear and having a coffee in her hand? So <laughs> I think uh, this is one of one of its kind, and that's why it's so good. Um, yeah. Also, I would recommend you to do the same, uh, so you'll enjoy conference um, more. You can sit back and um, you know have a pillow or have your teddy bear. <laughs> arms um yeah so um so i don't have much to say anymore uh, i will put on a um the sound echo really uh okay i'll shut up now <laughs> and um i'll be back in a bit and um yeah i will put on a little uh, like uh, some First of all, I think I will put on a, a little advertisement from our sponsor because uh, Microsoft also giving out swag. So please make sure to check them out and um, make sure that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you can get some swag from them. <laughs> so why not? And uh, yeah, and they are offering courses and things like that. So check out the uh, in Discord channel. There is the Microsoft uh, channel there. The sponsor will give you uh, information that may be interested to you. So uh, I will play the ad right now, and then the talk will start, start in 15 minutes, okay? So enjoy.
are back. So, are you ready for the first talk? Yes. So, uh, yeah. So we have, um, yeah, we have David uh, with us today for the first talk. It's amazing because David has done some crazy Python creation in the past. Uh, he has created games. Have created some uh, system retrieval uh, application, Django application, all this stuff. And he's going to tell us about how to create a. Bond. Hmm. I don't quite understand. Maybe we'll let him tell us a little bit more. So, uh, without further ado, I will introduce. I will let uh, David come on stage. Uh, hello. Okay. Hi. Hi, Joe. And hi, what at pajamas gone? Yeah, I love your pajamas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, where are you calling calling in from? <laughs> uh, it's a grey morning in Sheffield, UK, here at the moment. Yay! Yeah. Okay, yeah. Hopefully, um, is the weather is not too well. I, I don't really care because I'm staying indoor today. <laughs> so yeah, hope hopefully we'll all be uh, tucked up and nice and warm in bed today. Stay away yeah. from any weather. Yep, stay away from all this like possible wind, uh, rain, and wind. And <laughs> okay, so I would. Uh, so when you're ready, uh, I know we still have one minute, but. Uh, when you're ready, then we can maybe start uh, right now. If that's okay for you. Uh, sh let, let's leave it to the top of the clock. It's only like eight seconds to go. I think. <laughs> that's okay. So tell us a little bit about your uh, previous creations, because I've seen your bio and it's super interesting. Um, well, I've been using Python for 15 years, so I tend to do quite a lot of different things. Um, uh, so one of the Django apps I wrote was for a. Uh, Scraper Wiki, which is a company in Liverpool. <laughs> um, uh, but the first time I used Python was actually to do uh, systems programming for a wireless network uh, down in Cambridge. Yeah, it sounds cool. Which is quite well, unusual. Yeah, I can't wait to hear about uh, your font uh, to topography story. So I will let your presentation run and you can start the talk. Yeah. OK, great. Thanks. Away. Uh, hi, my name is David Jones. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I'd like to talk to you today about coding and typography. Uh, I'm a programmer at the University of Sheffield, um, and I use Python most days in my job. Um, I've been using Python for 15 years in one form or another, as well as various other programming languages. Uh, typography, however, is more of a hobby for me. You can find me listed on IMDB as a Kerning consultant, and I'm a member of the League of Movable Type. So this talk begins in the summer of 2020. I was signed off work with poor mental health. And one of the things I did to help heal myself was to rekindle my interest in typography. Out of that interest came to whimsical projects. The first at the top is a set of letters made from 24 millimeter decorators tape, which I'm converting to a font with a name yet to be decided. And continuing one of Twitter's great traditions, a thread where I pair fonts with Taylor Swift outfits. So Let's start by clearing up uh, a common confusion, the confusion between lettering and typography. I like to think of typography as systemized writing. Laura Masegua illustrates this perfectly in How to Create Typefaces. Writing is made with a pen or a pencil and made in one generally continuous motion. Lettering is the same process slowed down and made more formal. Letter forms can be very deliberate. Letters can be created with pencil, pen, vinyl, lino, film, fimo clay. Shapes can be corrected until they are perfect and they can join together in ways that are impossible to do at the speed of writing. In typography, the letter forms are designed by a type designer and the form is fixed forever in metal, photographic film, or an open type font file. 
the typographer then uses the font file to make books, memos, or other material. This separation of jobs was made possible by the invention of movable type. First, using porcelain type in China in the 11th century, and later metal type in Korea in 1377. Another confusion is the difference between typeface and font, terms that even practicing typographers like myself still confuse. A font is a single design in a single style, and when type was made in metal, a single size. Each size of type was a different metal font. A typeface, however, is a coherent design of several fonts in all its available sizes weights and styles. Here we see the typeface Comic Sans, available in regular, italic and bold styles. Late 20th century office software makes this italic and bold system seem very familiar. But in the 21st century, we increasingly see a typographic phenomenon that began in the 1960s with the font Universe. We see font families, this example is a family from Adobe called Adobe Source. Here we see three typefaces, Source Sans, Source Serif, and Source Code. Um, and these are respectively a sans serif type, a serif type, and a monospace type. And these typefaces are designed together as a coherent package and often share typographic metrics. Each of these typefaces comes in regular italic and bold fonts, but in addition, that idea is extended into semi-bold, light, ultra-bold, and often a condensed. And uh, for this particular um, font family, the source font family, these fonts are available in Latin scripts, which is what we use in uh, English, Welsh, and Portuguese, many European languages, a Greek script, and Cyrillic script. So a font is more than just a collection of letters. There are numbers and ampersands and other analphabetics that travel along with the alphabet. And while here, I've illustrated this with Latin, Greek, and Cyrillic writing systems, we should remember that those writing systems cover perhaps less than half the world's population. A truly global effort would cover Arabic, Devanagari, Hanzi, Hangul, and many more. And open type features, open type fonts, have features that support most of the world's writing systems. Let's have a look at how letter forms in a font are defined. The shapes of letter forms in a font are described mathematically using a series of curves called cubic bezier curves. It takes four points to define a cubic bezier. Two of those are on curve endpoints, and two of those are off curve control points. You can play around with these in Inkscape and other graphic design tools. The two endpoints define where the curve starts and finishes, and the two control points let you control the shape and character of the curve in between those two, two endpoints. Bezier curves have proven popular because they are relatively easy to design with, have useful mathematical properties, and are economical. Let's take a closer look at the glyph D. Glyph is a term type designers use to mean a particular shape of letter, number, or other shape. This is a proofing page for a single glyph generated by Charplot, which is in fact a Python program from the Adobe Font Development Kit for OpenType. Uh, Charplot shows you all of the points used to define this glyph. On the right, we see the curve for the bowl of the letter D. The outside curve is made of just two Bezier curves for a total of seven points. Using points and curves to describe shapes is an example of a vector format, and it allows the font 
to be numerically scaled to any size and resolution of device. That a font is more than just shapes. Here we see our first open type features. Open type features allow glyphs in fonts to interact in intelligent ways. On the left, we see an example of kerning. In most fonts, the natural fit between letters like T and A and A and Y mean that the font designer needs to reduce the space between those specific pairs. This is called kerning. There is an open type feature to implement that if the designer codes it. And it means that kerning will be available to all users of that font. Another feature, ligatures, joins glyphs together. On the right, we see an F colliding with an L because of the shape of the arch of the F. In metal typography, where this was a real problem because your metal would be the wrong shape and would not lock properly into the type form, this was solved by replacing the separate FL metal pieces of type with a single FL ligature. And there is an equivalent feature in open type features. The ligature feature in the open type font replaces the FL glyph pair with a specifically designed FL ligature. In this font, which is Adobe Source, the effect is quite subtle, but some fonts have a more radical lig ligature and other fonts have none. In Latin scripts, it's common to make a ligature for FF, FI, FJ, FL, FFI, and the ads command version. Are we okay here or do we have a problem? Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, it's common to make a ligature for FF, FI, FJ, FL, FFI, and FFL, and occasionally longer combinations. No, no problem there, Jake. Uh, these features are normally switched on, but there are other features that can be switched on at the discretion of the designer. Here we see Taylor Swift in her official lyric video for Exile using an ST and a CK ligature, which have joined the letter pairs with a graphic swash. These ligatures would normally have to be switched on by the designer. The spacing and transformation features that we have seen are nice formalities in Latin script fonts. But these and similar open type features are essential for typesetting Arabic, Devanagari, and a number of other scripts where, for example, in Arabic, um, the shape of a particular letter varies according to whether it is the first letter, the middle letter, or the final letter of a word. Um, in terms of the font file, that works by having open type features that transform the glyph according to its context. Let's have a, a look at a couple more discretionary open type features. Um, these two are considered um, essential by professional typographers. So on the top left, we have ranging numbers, so-called because they range between the baseline and the capital letter line. On the bottom left, we have non-lining numbers, which do not line up neatly between the lines they have different heights and cross the baseline. Typographers prefer non-lining numbers in running text where it's said that they go well with the lowercase letters you find. And there is an open type feature that lets you select them. In a similar vein, on the right, we have small caps, which have the shape of capital letters and the size of lowercase letters. We see small caps used for abbreviations, for emphasis, and sometimes in an opening paragraph with a decorative drop cap. And there's an open type feature that converts lowercase letters from their conventional forms to small cap forms. How do type designers do all of this? With font design tools, uh, software that lets font designers draw and manage their glyphs, compile open type font files, and some will have a system for defining open type features. Font Forge at the top 
uh, is free and open source software and runs on all major platforms. Robofont and Glyphs are much more popular, frankly. They are commercial uh, for the Mac platform and cost a few hundred dollars each. Uh, but all three are used by real font designers to make real fonts. What has this got to do with Python? All three systems have Python as a scripting language. And Python makes a great glue. Um, font designers will often need to convert one, form, one font format to another, or they might need to import art in SVG to a font. They might need to compile both open type font files and true type font files. They might need to proof their font in PDF and on the screen uh, and on a printer. All these tasks are done frequently and often it's a Python script that does these things. Taking that on board, Robofont, Robofont in particular um, has made this a specific design feature uh, around letting font designers make their own extensions in Python. And the font design community has taken that to heart. So this is a selection of uh, extensions and scripts from Robofont's uh, mechanic site where you can find extensions. And we have extensions like Drawbot and Verschreiber, which extend the way you can draw uh, glyphs. Kernalytics and Touche uh, analyze the geometry of your font for spacing and to examine where uh, elements touch each other where they should not. Jetset Glyphs and Glyph Copy let you copy glyphs between fonts and let you compare the same glyph in several fonts quickly. Wordomat and Zone Checker are proofing and preview tools that generate text and let you te check technical aspects of your font. And perhaps more familiar to the programmers uh, in the audience, um, there are also extensions to do version control. So let's have a look now at some open type coding. Uh, if you recall the open type feature to convert lowercase letters to small caps, here's what a smaller version of that looks in code. This is the Adobe feature syntax from the Adobe font development kit for OpenType. And this example is taken from Tal Lemming's book. Um, this isn't Python code, uh, but it shares some similarities. There are declarations at the top uh, to do with the language system that this feature works in. And this syntax for at lowercase and at small caps uh, defines a group which you can reference later on in the file. And whilst this isn't Python, we often see Python used to either manipulate these feature files or sometimes to generate them. So let's briefly talk about Python because this is a Python conference. We've seen Python form into larger systems in three different ways now. The first is you can put Python code in files and run it, either as a small script, an extension, or in fact, an entire application, a robofont is implemented in Python. The second illustrates using someone else's Python code. If someone else has taken the time to package their code, you can pip install it from PyPy and then import it in your program to use it. And the third of these is extending an application by adding Python as a scripting language. And this is possible from the C programming language and a few others. All three of these are really important ways in which Python the language helps form a community where we can share Python code. So I'm starting to close. Um, if you want to find out more, I have a few resources here. Um, the Elements of Typographic Style, uh, which is now in its fourth edition, uh, remains one of the best introductions to typography 
uh, at least in the West. Um, all typographers rec recommend this book with good reason. Um, it's really excellent and typographers will be referencing it throughout their career. Um, if you're more interested in font design, which is a particularly specialized aspect of typography, um, I recommend we start with a, a small and really beautiful book called How to Create Typefaces, uh, which was originally published in Portuguese um, and then I think Spanish and Chinese uh, and then eventually uh, English and is, is now available in, in several languages. Uh, really excellent uh, book there and quite practical. And even if not, you're not using FontForge, uh, the Design with FontForge manual is a useful guide for type design. Um, really practical, sort of really clear on, for example, what letters you should start to design first and then how to extend those few letters into the rest of your font, um, as well as how to work practically with the tool. And on the software side, um, you should have a look at Adobe Font Development Kit for OpenType, which is an open source uh, toolkit available on GitHub that does a lot of the um, tasks that I talked about previously, importing and exporting from different font files. Um, it lets you make uh, proofing previews of single letters and the entire type. Um, and this is what uh, the font engineers at Adobe use, and they've made their tools available. And one last item, Font Bakery uh, was a tool I contributed to in a small way this summer. It's a tool from Google that's like a quality assurance and testing tool uh, for fonts. And those bottom two are available on GitHub. So I'd like to reflect a little on why we choose Python and why the font design community has chosen Python. Simplicity, clarity, and generality are important aspects. And I have chosen Python for projects specifically for its simplicity and clarity. These are attributes that speak to the language itself. And these attributes definitely help a community like font designers who may not have had uh, much programming background. But I like another aspect of Python, the strong community. A community that we create here in Pyjamas Conf and at Python, Python conferences all around the world. Uh, PyCon UK isn't happening this year, but it's a, another great uh, Python community. Our community is inclusive and it helps remove the barriers that are normally put in place that stop people having access to computational thinking and programming. And I think we should do as much as possible to break down those barriers and tear down the patriarchy. Uh, that's the end. We can have questions now if you like. Thank you so much. This is amazing. This is really interesting. And it's so different from other talks I've seen in other conference. And I really love it. So yeah, for any of you who has questions, uh, please type in the chat on YouTube. And um, I have one question. So um, is there an equiv equivalent uh, of like phones in open source? So what, what would that be? So, um, yeah, so open source is about this idea that you should make your code available for everyone to use and reuse. And um, this isn't as strong in the font community, but there is an equivalent idea. Uh, the fonts available on fonts.google.com are all licensed under um, an open font license. Uh, I think it's called SIL. Um, and Adobe publish a very small number of their fonts as open source fonts. Uh, so Adobe Source is like a flagship for Adobe's open source font program. And it aims to show uh, various technical aspects of their font program as well. Um, and there's a sort of minor design community making their own open source fonts. So yeah, um, and that's one area where I think perhaps open source programming could positively influence uh, font design more of this spirit of, of openness and sharing. Yeah, so I can design my own fonts and upload to GitHub, like... Uh, yeah, you absolutely can. Idea? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but is it is it the, the platform like GitHub that people can upload their phones and share it there? Um, so people tend to upload finished artifacts and they tend to use my fonts for that, which is a, a merchandising platform. Uh, you can sell your fonts on my fonts, but you can also give them away. Um, but often I think version control is coming sort of reluctantly <laughs> to the font design community, um, but they are getting used to the idea that fonts are versioned objects and you should put them on GitHub. So Adobe source is available on GitHub and other people are starting to put their fonts on GitHub too. Uh, I think Google is really driving that actually, because if you want your fonts listed on fonts.google.com, then it has to be sourced from a, a GitHub source for that. Really? That's very interesting. I didn't know that GitHub is also useful for the fonts community. And yeah, I think that's great. <laughs> so yeah, uh, uh, I don't see any more questions from the chat. Uh, it's a really good talk. If uh, people are interested uh, to talk about more, maybe uh, they can find you on Discord, is it? Uh, yeah, I'll try and hang out on Discord, and they can find me on Twitter as well. Oh, there is a oh, there's there a question one. just come in. Abigail um, is asking how we handle multiple people collaborating on the same font. So um, one thing I should point out is I'm not a font designer yet, so I don't know everything. Um, but <laughs> people absolutely do uh, collaborate on fonts. Um, a font is quite big these days. Back in 1990, a font used to be 200 glyphs. Now it's more like a thousand. So one way to collaborate is simply split up the glyphs. One person will do Latin, another person will do Greek, another person will do Cyrillic. Um, and occasionally you get uh, fonts from even more diverse scripts. So like Latin and Arabic. And you will definitely need to do that as a collaborative effort. And again, version control really helps here because you can work on different parts of the font version control those and then they can be merged back together yeah that's that's really good and maybe we should all try it out <laughs> um and figure it out how it works so yeah there is uh so yeah uh and any n ask uh so so yeah just say that uh, thank you for your presentation <laughs> so yeah uh and then yeah so a discord channel so if you are a ticket holder you uh, you can join the discord channel you should get an email about that so yeah thank you david uh thank right, you so much you. and i'll let you go and um yeah so Right, so um, yeah, so we still have a few minutes towards the next talk. And like I said, if you want to join our Discord discussion, uh, you can, well, if you haven't got a ticket yet, uh, you can register for a ticket. Uh, it's on our website, it's pyjamas.live. Um, and then you can register a ticket there and then you would receive an email uh, talking about the Discord channel. Uh, if you have registered before, you should get an email um, yesterday uh, about uh, joining the Discord channel. So uh, let's see if we have more chats coming in. And um, yeah, so uh, our next talk, uh, actually is oh but actually before the next talk since we have a few minutes i would like to show you a, a, a message from our sponsor uh well uh, microsoft is our cashmere sponsor and also they have uh, offered some courses some uh, some goodies for every one of you so please check them out uh, they also have a channel on discord and you can check out the message there as well so yeah So our next talk, uh, we will have Bo Yan. So Bo Yan uh, has recorded for us uh, for his talk. And um, so Bo Yan is kind of like a unicorn because uh, he left a uh, very nice uh, job, uh, a Python uh, developer lead job in Silicon Valley and started his own company in Serbia, which is very interesting. I'm sure that uh, his talk is also very interesting and uh, you can learn a lot from his experience. So. Uh, I would play the talk and then I would let you watch it. So enjoy.
Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, today I'm going to try to talk with you about uh, building your prototype and getting it all, uh, to the, all the way to the production in just 20 minutes. Let's see if we can do that. First about me, I started working as a software developer almost a decade ago. My first uh, journey into programming was with JavaScript, which made me choose Python and never ever look again to the front end <laughs> side of things. I also own a small, uh, small company, Softterific, and we do some pretty cool stuff with Python as well as software consulting. Uh, it might seem uh, quite obvious uh, to all of you that if you want to build something very fast, you need to know uh, what you're building. But usually when we talk with clients, uh, we get, uh, oh yeah, that's correct. And we're thinking about the same thing. So all is clear and we can start building. And somewhere along the way, uh, when we get uh, some demos going, the client is going to start saying, but that's not what we talk about. Uh, we talked about something completely different. Uh, there are lots of problems in communication that can happen. So it's very important to oh, everybody knows what you're building and everybody be on the same page. Even though uh, usually people say, yeah, I understand what's going to happen. So in order to help us uh, avoid uh, having to recode uh, large portions of our code base, we're going to have to start way, way, way uh, before uh, actual coding. Now, uh, prototypes are pretty awesome. Uh, they're going to help us avoid misunderstanding and make sure we all know what we're building. Now, uh, as a software developer, you might think, uh, oh, prototype is just a simple website that uh, displays some basic functionality, sort of an MVP. Uh, I learned the hard way that uh, this is not usually the case. Depending on your client and their area of expertise, a prototype is going to mean completely different things. One time I was uh, working with a client who specialized in embedded uh, software and uh, hardware development. So when I was talking about the building a website prototype, he gave me a very strange look and told me, this does make no sense at all. Why would you want to build an electronic board for a website? It's going to take us a few weeks to get everything uh, from the factory. Uh, for them, uh, prototype was basically hardware. <laughs> uh, for designers, prototype uh, can be a little uh, sketch on the paper, which leads me into our next uh, segment. Do not be afraid of the paper. Uh, paper itself is worth its uh, weight in gold and then some more. Uh, it's very, very helpful in the beginning uh, phases to just make a rough uh, sketch of how things uh, should look. And it helps you and your client uh, to understand what you're talking about. And once again, to make sure you're speaking the same language. Uh, one good thing about prototyping is uh, with paper is that uh, if you mess something up, you can just grab another piece of paper and uh, re-sketch it. So it takes only a few seconds uh, to fix errors here. If you want to do that in the later phases of the project, well, it's going to take more time. If you are already starting doing some design and you detect some uh, problems, it's going to take a uh, few hours. Uh, if you are already doing deployment and your code is written, any errors in user flow you detect then, it's going to take a few days or weeks uh, to fix. So, love your papers and uh, draw. Now, it doesn't have to be nice. It just needs to be able to convey general idea, what are we building, and, see, and to get some uh, basic user flows to make sure everybody is doing uh, what it's supposed to. Myself, uh, top of my artistical talents is drawing stick uh, figures. 
and it's perfectly fine <laughs> uh, for these sorts of jobs. So don't be shy. If I can uh, draw some uh, prototypes and not be ashamed of them, you can do it too. Now, uh, one very, very good advice is to be nice uh, to people in general, but especially designers. Uh, they're doing the hardest part of the project. Uh, now, I know lots of programmers are going to uh, give me a weird look. Or the designers doing the hardest project. We're programming and all the stuff. Well, uh, they're talking with clients. And I haven't met a single person that didn't have an opinion about the design, regardless of their uh, background. In programming, you usually have a sort of a entry bar where you, okay, you need, you know some things about coding, uh, you know how things should look like, and then you can uh, give sort of opinion. In design, everybody has opinion about it, and everybody's telling your designers how they should do their work, which is very hard and stressful for them. So be extra nice to them. Uh, now, the thing, uh, for example, let me share uh, one of the stories. Uh, we were doing uh, some demo for the client, and somewhere in the middle, during the middle of the project, uh, we discovered that we need to do complete redesign of the entire product because clients uh, five years old didn't like our website. And uh, I'm so proud of our uh, designer uh, that managed to create a new design and not go crazy. <laughs> Imagine doing the same thing, uh, but with your uh, backend code. Also, uh, the work your designers are going to do on refining the prototype is absolutely priceless. Uh, they do, they can use uh, Figma, uh, for perfecting UX, uh, for uh, making sure a client can see some functionality and how it will behave uh, without any actual code. Now, uh, regarding Figma, I'm going to use it as an example here, mostly because uh, I'm forbidden from doing any design work, since I can name maybe eight colors. Uh, but my designers told me Figma is good and they love it, so I'm just going to talk about Figma. That doesn't mean it's the best tool about design, so I'm talking, talking from the perspective of a programmer who knows uh, some designers who know uh, their job. <laughs> now, uh, when we start project, usually everybody is super hyped up, especially clients and engineers, and we all want to start uh, building stuff. And that's our first impulse, and it's usually quite wrong. Uh, you need to, as I mentioned before, define your prototype and make sure you have clearly set up what is your MVP. Uh, and then uh, there comes a very important step uh, that we miss a lot of the time. You need uh, some person Usually that's product owner, project manager, anybody uh, who can use the secret uh, superpower of common sense to go over everything and see, does this make sense? And maybe take a look, uh, look at the competition, figure out features, uh, what we need to improve, uh, what works uh, in the current form, what doesn't work. As I mentioned, uh, very, very good uh, tool here is uh, that we use with our client is Figma. Uh, that way client can see some website functionality, uh, see what happens when he clicks on a button, uh, see uh, scrolls, uh, see how it will look on mobile phone and stuff like that. And then once everybody is super happy and satisfied, only then we can actually start coding. Now, Yes, uh, we are about middle way to our presentation and only now I'm going to start talking about uh, coding. And uh, I was debating with myself if I should do it even later. 
it's very, very important to do your uh, preparations for the actual project. Because as I mentioned before, uh, fixing stuff uh, in your code uh, that was improperly designed or defined uh, earlier is going to take you several magnitudes of time uh, more uh, than if you did that on the paper or uh, design. So don't rush. Everybody loves coding, but you need to do it at the right time. And uh, Here's one of the very interesting facts. The further you are from the client, uh, the more uh, you're going to be in your job without any disruptions. Closer you are to the client, uh, there's going to be much greater frequency of the change. Design is that's the component that's going to change the most, usually several times a day. Front end the mobile apps they're going to have lower frequency because usually once uh, something goes to the front-end development, it already went through the several iterations of design. Uh, back-end? Well, uh, as a back-end developer, you're probably going to change much uh, your code much with less frequency than a uh, front-end developer. And DevOps? Uh, those are the cool, cool guys that set up message queues, database, server infrastructure, permission in AWS, cloud deployment, all the crazy stuff. They're probably not going to have uh, frequent infrastructure changes. So, further away you are from humans, uh, less stressful your job is. Unless things go wrong. Then uh, it's uh, every man for itself. <laughs> Now, uh, since most of us here are Python developers, that means uh, hopefully we are working in the backend development. And our main uh, job is going to be to connect uh, front end uh, with the uh, DevOps uh, segment of their area of expertise database, message queues, all the crazy stuff. And the most important part of that uh, journey is going to be how we communicate with each of them. Uh, we want to separate, uh, make a clean cut between us and front end, and click uh, and very uh, nicely defined border between us and DevOps. That way, they can uh, do their stuff, uh, and we can do ours uh, without affecting each other. With that in mind. Uh, in order for front-end and back-end to communicate uh, nicely, uh, you need to define uh, how you're going to talk to each other. And that means having uh, API documentation. Uh, one thing you should, you should know is that your front-end developers have a lot of work on their hands. Every day they have to deal with JavaScript and CSS. And people who can do that, they're very, very scary and they have pretty much nothing to lose. So you don't want to make them angry. And first uh, step in doing that is to have a good uh, API documentation. That way, uh, they're not going to show up at your door at night. And uh, since we're all humans, uh, we need to avoid the manually updating APIs because Speaking from experience, every time I had to update the manually API, at uh, some point in time, I completely forgot, uh, oh, I made a change, uh, I need to edit the API, I can do it that later. That later uh, never came. So with that in mind, uh, try to auto-generate the API documentation. Luckily, as Python programmers, we're kind of lazy, so we got lots of awesome tools uh, to help us with that. Uh, I love using, for example, Fast API because everything I change it's automatically reflected in API documentation. Uh, I did a little bit of work with uh, Django REST framework, uh, which has ability to do the same thing, but 
I think uh, you can find that uh, for whichever uh, your, is your web framework of preference. But uh, try to write as less as possible and make your code to do most of the work for you. So once again, laziness is a virtue here. Uh, with that in mind, we can uh, start uh, communicating with uh, our databases, uh, message queues, everything uh, that is backend of our backend. Here things are going to be a bit uh, different uh, because you are not going to have uh, API uh, from your DevOps team. Uh, in order to make sure you're doing uh, things correctly, you're going to have to build something similar to API and that is uh, using abstractions that define our communication uh, towards those uh, objects. We're stealing this uh, from uh, Java developers. They've been doing this stuff for decades and it worked uh, quite nicely for them. Uh, basically, what we want to accomplish here is uh, since infrastructure of your project, when you start working on it, and infrastructure at the end, that's going to be two completely different things. Uh, for example, at the start of a project, you might be using SQLite. Then at some point, you might move to Postgres SQL. Then later uh, to Amazon Aurora or maybe some uh, NoSQL database. Uh, what we want to accomplish is that uh, every migration to another service uh, in the background changes our code as little as possible. And we want to localize those changes, uh, which is where abstractions come uh, quite handy. Uh, uh, here, uh, we can see an example of that. Uh, we can define abstract class that we're going to call database provider. And uh, as soon as uh, some segment of our code needs something uh, from the database, we just add that method uh, to database provider. Now we want to make sure that everybody uh, who uh, does concrete implementation of this uh, data this class is going to provide actual methods. So your SQLite provider is going to inherit database provider and implement, for example, get user information method that we defined in database provider. Uh, we can do this uh, for, uh, for Postgres SQL provider as well and any other type of database. Now, once you start working with your uh, code, uh, you can just uh, plug uh, your provider with which you are currently working. And you don't have to change anything anywhere else. Uh, also, one of the good sides about all this is that you can very easily test it. It's super easy to just uh, create your own mock database provider inherit database provider and you know uh, what methods you need to implement uh, and then test the functionality of the rest of the system. When you implement concrete uh, provider, for example, Postgres SQL provider, you're just going to focus on the te your testing on that concrete provider to make sure methods are doing what they are supposed to do. The rest of the system is going to function the same way. Uh, what we want to accomplish is that our system is completely agnostic about uh, what uh, is the concrete implementation of that uh, database provider. Type hints are pretty awesome here because uh, with them our code is going to complain, uh, MyPy is going to complain uh, when we start uh, using incorrectly methods. So use type hints, uh, they can uh, help you quite a lot. Now, uh, here's something that everybody's talking about, but sadly I've seen it ignored quite a lot in practice. Uh, usually people are saying, oh, it takes too long uh, to write tests. Uh, 
or I can do uh, without writing tests. It's not that hard. And yes, I'm going to uh, tell something that probably you didn't expect to hear, but yes, sometimes it's faster to just deliver the code without tests. This only works for a throwaway code. Uh, and in my experience, throwaway code is never throwaway code. Uh, if you make a prototype website that is uh, put quickly together with uh, glues and sticks in the background, client is going to assume, oh, this is perfectly fine. And that uh, throwaway code is going to become your code base uh, for later development. So resist the temptation of not writing the tests. Uh, it's almost impossible to grow your code base without tests. I've seen examples of that, and it was usually just one person doing that. And the moment they move from a project or when they need to onboard somebody to help them with the workload, it was almost uh, impossible. Uh, doing a development in team as most of us do without tests uh, is going to waste a lot of time because uh, tests are going to catch a huge number of errors so you have changes and you commit uh, a specific uh, branch you just run the tests and tests are going to detect if everything is uh, working nicely and then you uh, create your uh, pull requests where somebody is going to review the code and make sure everything is nice. Lots of that, this stuff uh, can be automized, uh, which is quite useful and handy for us. Uh, now, um, also refactoring. No matter how good your code base at the beginning is, as your system grows and develops, there are going to be uh, some uh, point in time when you're going to need to refactor certain portions. And doing that without tests is almost impossible. With tests, we can change uh, huge portions of our code and be sure that we didn't break anything. So write tests, uh, because without them, you cannot uh, develop quickly, even though uh, it might uh, sound easier to just write the code. Uh, Thanks everybody uh, for having me here. And if you have any question for me, I'll be uh, sticking around. So feel free to reach out to me. Bye. Okay, so that's a brilliant talk. And now, Yes. Um, so uh, I would actually, uh, my co-host is here. So actually, I would bring him on stage, and then uh, yeah, and then like uh, we would, we still have some time uh, before the next talk. So what I'm going to do now is that again, I'll play the ad, and then I would uh, let my co-host come on stage, and then um, yeah, so uh, keep on watching. <laughs>
Okay, hello, Itai. Are you here? Yeah, hey. hello. Hello. So, yeah, you'll be hosting uh, for us, right? Yes, that's true. Okay, so I will pass it on to you. Is that right? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, see you in a bit. See you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Itai. I'm here to uh, welcome our next uh, speaker. Uh, his name is Jens Winkleman. He'll be uh, presenting live. He has a PhD uh, in physics from Trinity College. And uh, his talk uh, is named Data Mining with Mining Data, How Data Science Improves the World's Largest Machines. Um, hope you've been enjoying your time with us and you're wearing your comfiest pajamas. And uh, here, here he comes. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, sound is good? Yeah, sounds great. Perfect. Can you see my screen as well? Um, let's see. Probably I'm missing something. No, actually, I don't. No, now, you do. Now I do. Yeah, great. Perfect. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Okay. All right, let me go back. Okay, have you ever thought about how Python can solve some of the most pressing challenges in the heavy industry? Now, in this talk, I'm going to present you some data science use cases from the mining industry. And I can hopefully convince you that Python can be a real gold mine. The use cases I present you are actually projects that I got to work on in my job um, as a data scientist at Talpa Solution. So first of all, uh, let me introduce myself and let me introduce Talpa Solution. So I'm Jens Winkelmann and I work now for pretty much a year at Talpa, as a data scientist at Talpa Solution. Now before that, I did a PhD in physics um, at Trinity College Dublin and was actually one of those who graduated online this year um, because of Corona. But originally I'm from Essen in Germany, um, which is close to Düsseldorf, as you can see here on the map, and which is also the home of Talpa Solution. And actually, I'm now living just across uh, the street from my former primary school, which is uh, quite interesting. So what's so special about Essen is it's in the heart of the Ruhr Valley, which is a former mining region. And at various places in the city, you can still see abandoned mining shafts like this one here at the lake. Mm, but that actually makes Essen the perfect place for our business, um, because our goal is to digitize the heavy industry, especially the international mining industry. And amongst our customers are gold mines, copper mines, mineral salt mines, gypsum mines, and all other types of mines um, where you need to mine materials. And we're actually doing this with some success. We were awarded a startup of the month in February um, in the Ruhr Valley by the Ruhr Hub. Um, so yeah, uh, what does type of solution do? What is our business? So at the moment, the heavy industry uses roughly of 1% of its data. So data such as speed or payload from a truck um, are created by control units and the communication units of the machine, um, but the data is not stored um, for like big data analysis. And our mission is now to make money with the other 99% of that unused data. So it's approximated to be a billion dollar business and we want to have a good share in it. Um, and at the moment we only focus on the mining industry. So what we are currently building is like a big cloud-based big data pipeline that stores and analyzes machine data from mine sites. So the pipeline usually starts with one of our solution engineers um, traveling to the customer and installing this little box here. And we call this little box the Talpa Cortex, because what it does is it extracts um, and sends the sensor signals from the machine to our um, cloud, um, cloud platform. And there we analyze the data and we also store the data. And then we can show the analyzed data to our customer in a web application. And that hopefully provides some actionable insights to them. So the task of the data scientist within this pipeline is, of course, to develop and implement the data analysis part. Um, so typical use cases for such um, data analysis in the mining industry are activity detection, pothole detection, and predictive maintenance. So similar to object detection in image recognition, the sensors of a truck can be used um, to classify its activity. So uh, usual um, activities of a truck are loading, dumping, driving loaded, or driving unloaded, or just idling. And then from the sen sensor signals, such as payload, speed, and dump angle, you can infer its current activity. And then another important topic is that of pothole detection, or just hot zone detection in general. And such analysis can usually be constructed by um, um, from sensor data, such as um, suspension data, 
uh, together with GPS signals, and then you want to show the hotspots of certain potholes in the mine site on a map um, so that the mine operator knows which roads needs to be fixed um, in the future. Mm. And the third major use case is that of predictive maintenance. And here the goal is simply to predict or prevent a future unplanned maintenance event um, based on historical data from the machines. And the great news is you can do all this in Python. So during this presentation, I'm going to cover all of these three use cases by using hands-on examples from actual dump truck data. Mm -hmm. So in the first part, um, I will present you an algorithm that can classify the different activities of a dump truck. In the second part, we will then use the suspension data of a dump truck to analyze the road conditions of a mine site. So essentially, we're doing pothole detection, and we will display the, the particular spots of severe road conditions um, on a hot, as hot zones on a map. In the last part, I will then give you a brief outlook um, of what, what our path towards predictive maintenance looks like. And here, the long-term goal is to predict when a particular component needs maintenance. And I will show you that this all starts with anomaly detection. So we'll introduce you to our approach, how to detect such anomalies in truck suspensions, which just serves as an example for a particular component. Mm. So first of all, what's a truck or what's a dump truck? So Elon Musk might call this a truck, but we at Helper Solution think this is a real truck. So you can see some people here for scale. So let's um, just dive into some fun facts about um, a dump trucks. So the maximum speed is just roughly 50 kilometers per hour, but they have a lot of power, which is like a thousand horsepowers, and they need this to actually carry the nominal payload of like 50 to 400 tons. So the largest dump truck in the world can carry 400 tons. And um, for scale, a blue whale weighs around 100 tons. So the biggest one can carry like four blue whales. And of course, such machines need like um, a lot of fuel, so that the um, average fuel consumption is like 60 liters per hour. So it's like 10 times higher of that of a normal car. And in case you're interested in buying one, they cost around one to 10 million euros. Mm. Um, so in the first section, I want to go into detail about classifying a truck's activity. Um, so the first question you might ask yourself, or at least a customer ask themselves is, why should we care about uh, activity detection? And the thing is, mine, mine operates usually in a very challenging environment. So that could be either in a desert or in the mountains. And the workflows are very complex. And that usually requires a constant overview of what each machine is doing in the mine. And the solution that we provide then is a digital surveillance of the mine's productivity. And the basis for all this builds the um, activity detection. So based on the activity detection, we can calculate certain key performance indicators. Um, so they just give you an indication of the productivity of, for instance, a truck. Um, and you can also build further analysis for more actionable insights, such as predictive maintenance or hot zone detection on activity detection. So essentially, um, activity detection builds the basis to provide actionable insights for mine operators. Mm. So it all starts with the type of cortex sending us um, data from the machine. So amongst this data could be payload, speed, and dump angle. And you can already see in the payload that the, um, the payload is going up sometimes and then it's going down sometimes. And already can tell that there's some loading going on and there's some unloading going on. And now we want to detect the activities from it. But the issue that we have is the data is not labeled that we get. So all the supervised learning algorithms that you might think of are out the window. Mm -hmm. And our solution to this is essentially a rule-based algorithm. So let's have a look at the different activities and their rules. Um, as I mentioned before, there are like six distinct Rules, uh, since it takes activities, the loading, the driving loaded, the idle loaded, the unloading, idle unloaded, and driving unloaded. And now um, we came up with these rules um, for each activity together with some mining engineers. So we have like domain knowledge here that helps us. And essentially a rule-based algorithm works like a decision tree. Um, but instead of the algorithm learning the thresholds or the, the rules um, for the decisions um, from training data, um, we set the rules by like smart guesstimations from us. So in the following slides, I will now present you the rules in form of pseudocode, as you can see here. Um, and we usually use the usual Python uh, data science stack for this. So you can see some NumPy here, and you see some um, Pandas data frames here, and we also use some scikit-learn for this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's start with the first activity, which is the loading activity. Uh, so a truck can be loaded by either a wheel loader or an excavator. Um, for this, you, you usually have to rule that the speed the, the truck is standing um, and the payload has to um, change and it has to increase. And we can track this by looking at the standard deviation. And the dump angle, which is the angle of the dump bucket in the back, has to be 
down or zero, essentially. Then when it's fully loaded, it starts to drive somewhere. So you have the driving loaded activity. So for this, of course, speed has to be up. There has to be something in the dump bucket and the dump angle should be down. Then in between these driving parts, he can idle for some reasons. So that could be that he's just stuck in a queue somewhere or he's waiting at the dumping place um, for him to, 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 yeah, to, to for his turn or he's just taking a break for some reason. And the thing is that these are actually inefficiencies and it means a loss of money for the mine operator. So it's quite important to detect those activities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the, um, the next activity would then be the um, unloading activity. So when it reaches the dumping place, it un unloads its material somewhere. And these routes are actually quite similar to the loading activity with the big difference that now the dump list has to be up. Mm -hmm. And after he finishes the unloading, he will return to the pit again to be reloaded. So for this, he's driving unloaded. But hopefully not like this. Hopefully the dump angle is down. So this is just an illustration of a, a driving unloaded truck, but not actually at the mine site. So um, again, here the speed should be up, the payload should be should be uh, should be no payload in the bucket, and the dump angle should be down, opposed to what you see here in this little GIF. And in between the driving unloaded parts, he can be idling again. So the reason CF could be that he's just waiting in front of an excavator because there's a truck being loaded in front of him. So the truck on the back that you see here is actually currently idling, which is again, an unproductive behavior that you want to detect um, and tell the mine operator for, for improvements. Mm. And this already closes the cycle again, um, because the next activity would be the loading activity. And all these six activities actually make up what's called a productive cycle. Mm. So all a truck is doing during a shift is going through this cycle. So it will start loading, then he's driving loaded somewhere, he might be idling in between, he's unloading his material, and then he's driving back unloaded to be reloaded again. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, we can now calculate certain key performance indicators um, for each truck. And these KPIs provide information about the productivity of the truck. So one example could be the number of passes. And I want to explain this. KPI based on the um, payload signal that you can see here in, in the solid line on the left. And um, the blue shaded area that you see here is the loading activity that we detected. Now, the number of passes can easily be calculated by the number of steps that you see here in the payload signal, because each of these steps um, relate to a, um, to a bucket from the excavator or from the wheel loader. Mm -hmm. In this case, you can count five steps. And if you now track them over time, you can build up a histogram of those number of passes. Mm. And from mining engineers, we know that the optimal number of passes should be at four. So, it, uh, so the histogram should follow a binomial distribution around four, which is roughly the case here. So here the maximum is at five, which is good. But like strong deviations from um, this binomial distribution will tell you that there's something going wrong. So if you have like a too high number of um, of passes, um, that could mean that uh, your truck is loaded by the wrong excavator, and that um, provides the, the actionable insights to the um, to the operator to maybe change his equipment and get a new excavator. Mm -hmm. So, um, further examples for important KPIs that we can calculate based on um, activity detections are tonnage transported, or just the number of cycles that were done in a um, uh, in a day or so, and what's the, the average cycle duration, so that's something that we can calculate. Um, but the number of buckets is a very nice example of how, um, how, how we can provide action plan sites to uh, mine operators. Mm -hmm. But the rule-based algorithms is not actually the optimal solution. So we face a couple of issues here um, because we cannot use any supervised learning techniques um, because we have no labels. But um, we want to use supervised learning techniques because of scalabilities. So the issue that we have at the moment is we get a new truck, um, which slightly different sensors. So that could be that just the payload sensor is not working properly, that there's some issues there. Um, then um, we need new routes for this. And so the scalability is not given that much. And our strategy for improving here is actually to um, uh, get some labels first and then apply a supervised learning to those labels. Um, so these labels could come from either that you um, yeah, create, use your rule-based algorithm at, as ground truth and then um, label your data accordingly to that. Or you could also get uh, labels based on video recording from the mine site. And then yeah, somebody has to sit there and say, no, the truck is loading, no, the truck is unloading, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then we could actually transfer, um, yeah, transfer uh, 
algorithms to other trucks more easily. Mm. Then the second part of my talk, I will now go into more details on pothole detection. So here the goal is to display certain hotspots of severe road conditions on a map. And then the action that the mine operator can take is he can fix the roads quite efficiently. And the benefits that he gets from that is um, he can remove bottlenecks because trucks usually slow down in front of potholes. And he can also extend the lifetime of his truck, especially his suspensions and his frame. So first of all, how does your how does our algorithm work? Mm. So all you need for this is actually the suspension pressure. So here's an example of this pressure scale between zero and one. Um, and they actually work quite similar to the suspension that you have in your car. Um, so that purpose is to absorb um, any shocks um, from the wheels. Um, and they actually consist of like an oil gas mixture and we can measure the pressure of the gas. So that's the signal that you see here. Um, now the algorithm itself consists of four steps. In the first step, we just filter the suspension pressure for any driving activity. So again, this algorithm based on activity detection. Um, in the second step, we then calculate the pressure difference. So that's the difference between the upper red curve and the lower red curve that you can see here. Um, then we use Uber's H3 library to create like a hex, like a, or we tile our, our mind site into hexagons. Um, and then if the pressure exceeds a certain threshold, we add this pressure to the related hexagon. And then we can play the sum of all um, pressure differences on a map. Um, it's like a heat map. And they sh this shows us then where we have certain hotspots. And the nice thing about this algorithm is it's quite independent of the truck model because all you need is the suspension data. Mm. So here's a prediction or an example of a prediction of this algorithm in form of a heat map. Mm. So what you see here is part of a mine. So all hexagons essentially correspond to roads where the trucks were driving. And the ones that are colored um, orange and red um, show you some severe road conditions. And the more red they are, the more severe are the road conditions. Um, so now by looking at this map, you can clearly see that there are two spots that sh probably should need some fixing. And these road jumps are essentially hotspots where I would recommend fixing. However, um, what we still need to do here is a proper validation of this algorithm because we don't really know where we have like false positives or ne negatives um, because we might get like false positives to, to um, brake usage. Um, so we could add like a filter here we could also filter by road utilization because we don't want to show like um, bad roads that are hardly being used anyway. Mm. And then in the last few minutes, I want to give you a brief outlook on the topic of predictive maintenance. But I don't want to go into too much detail here, so we'll only describe this um, or describe our current plans to predict possible maintenance events for suspensions. Mm. So first of all. The idea behind predictive maintenance are essentially two points. We want to detect maintenance, um, maintenance events before they occur, and we want to avoid any unplanned downtime due to failures. So the worst thing that can happen is a situation like this, where a truck starts burning, because then yeah, you just wasted a million dollars, and it will also take some time to get a new truck to come up to yeah, um, come up with the, the efficiency that you lost and so on. So essentially, the thing is um, prescriptive or Predictive maintenance saves you unnecessary costs. And now the road towards predictive maintenance is beset by three major milestones. Um, the first one is descriptive maintenance. So all you want to do here is live cast your sensor data. You want to detect certain anomalous behaviors, for instance, in your suspension pressures. Um, in a second step, um, you want to then do predictive maintenance. So you can correlate your anomalies to environmental factors, so in terms of uh, suspensions that could be the number of potholes. And from this, you can then infer when a possible maintenance um, based on those factors um, might be needed. And in the last step, you actually want to go ahead and give recommendations to the mine operator how he can actually extend the lifetime of his suspensions, for instance, or if truck, um, so that they don't become any blocking points. Mm. So the first step is always live casting your signals for any anomalies. And in our case, you want to do this with the suspension pressures. Mm. So our general framework here consists of three components, of which the hard piece is actually a deep neural network, as you can see here. Um, and um, um, so it all starts with the suspension pressure coming in. Then we do some pre-processing here where we calculate certain features. So that could be like the, the mean pressure or the standard deviation of the um, suspension pressures. Mm. And then you feed those features in as inputs to this um, uh, 
autoencoder. So this is a deep neural network. And what it does is it encodes the signals first and then it decodes it again. Mm, and so essentially uh, what you get at the end is the it reproduces the input features, um, um, but without with the noise um, removed essentially. Mm, so the anomaly score then describes the difference between the output and the input. Um, and essentially an anomaly score goes up if there's any unusual behavior in the suspension pressures. Mm. Now, the next step towards predictive maintenance would then be um, to correlate um, or to, to investigate uh, correlations between the anomaly scores and some external factors. So for the external factors, we again would need some domain knowledge from mining engineers. So possible correlations factors could be the payload or the number of potholes or just the activities itself. Mm. So let's just pretend that we discovered a linear relationship in the historical data between the anomaly score and the number of potholes. Um, we can then predict with a linear regression um, what number of potholes we will reach at the threshold for the anomaly score. And based on this, we can tell our customers um, yeah, when, at what time the anomaly score is reached and at what time we will probably need maintenance. So with this done, we have then reached the milestone of predictive maintenance. Then, yeah, this already concludes my presentation. And as a summary, I have three major take home messages for you. The first one is activity detection sets the basis of actionable sites in the mining industry. And it is possible to detect pos uh, potholes in the mine site from suspension data. And then the third one is the path towards predictive maintenance is beset by three major milestones. One is descriptive maintenance, predictive maintenance, and prescriptive maintenance. Mm, and thank you for your attention. If you want to learn more about type of solution or our work, you can yeah, check out our website or LinkedIn page. And um, we're essentially a small startup with um, roughly 40 international um, people from all around the world. Mm, and we have all kinds of backgrounds. So I'm a physicist. We have some, um, uh, some computer scientists in there as well, um, some mining engineers, of course. And yeah, feel free to contact me about my work or um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, now is the time, I guess. Thank you very much, Jens. That was uh, fascinating. Let's look at the comments to see if there's any questions. Um, let's see quick. Uh, do you have an example story from uh, JC3 Phi? Uh, do you have an example story of something going really wrong in a dev project? Um, sorry, what's the question? Um, the question was, do you have an example story of something going really wrong in a dev project? Dev project. A, a dev project. Uh, maybe, I'm sorry, maybe it's from the before and I got confused. Anyway, I don't see any questions, so um, thank you very much. Uh, it was really interesting, and we'll wait a bit um, for the next session. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. And uh, until then, a word from our sponsors. So we still have time until, okay, just to make sure that you can hear me. Okay, uh, we still have time until the next talk. So uh, Itay, do you want to come in and have a chat? Just a quick chat. Hey. Yeah, sure, hi. Hi, so uh, yeah, like I think people may be interested in how we got this started. So uh, do you remember why, like when you joined the organizing team and why you joined? <laughs> wow, that's, um, it's been a far, it's uh, way back. A while ago, yeah. Yeah, I think it was December. Uh, we started 
talking about this, right? Or even January. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, I got contacted uh, by a friend, and um, we were looking. Anyway, we were looking for uh, people in our time zones so we can help each other with uh, hosting and stuff like that in our time zones. And um, that's how I got here. Um, that's it. It's yeah. been very interesting. It's my first uh, conference I've been helping to uh, try and bring up. Um, hope I did good. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's it. That's uh, yeah. how it so we have yeah so we are so glad that you joined the organizing team and actually like it takes months to prepare for this conference even though it's an online conference but actually there's a lot of work uh, that is behind the scene that people may be not seeing right now and yeah one of the challenges that we plan to run for 24 hours so this is the thing that the first thing I think about in my mind is that, oh my God, like I'm not going to stay awake for 24 hours. Hopefully not. Uh, so yeah, we need uh, more people to help. So uh, I tell uh, where, where are you calling from? People didn't know. <laughs> I'm calling from Israel. Um, it is 11.50 now here uh, in the morning, uh, soon, uh, noon soon. And uh, yeah, we also have two other speakers uh, from Israel as well, which is our next speaker also, which uh, I'm not introducing yet. This is just... Uh, yeah, save that for later. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but uh, we do have quite a diversity here, which I'm so happy about. Like uh, even in our organizing team, we have people from different countries and uh, a volunteers team as well. Luckily, we have volunteers from different parts of the world to help us to cover all 24 hours, which is a big challenge. And um, also we have, a, you know, people uh, help organizing, you know, help us to make the schedule work, to help to uh, contact sponsors, help to contact uh, volunteers and everything. So yeah, it's a lot of work. And, um, but it's an exciting experience, is it? Like so far, do you like it? I do, this is very interesting. It's very interesting. I, I, I learned a lot of new tools, for instance, StreamYard, which we're streaming through. Uh, it's really nice and really useful for the future as well. Uh, also, thanks um, PyCon Ireland and uh, and Microsoft, our sponsors, uh, for helping bring this thing up, basically. Yeah, so uh, we are working with PyCon Ireland closely this year uh, to deliver Pyjamas Conf, and um, so they help us a lot, and uh, and also their their organizers really. Uh, integrated with our team and um yeah it's, it's a really good experience and i hope all of you enjoyed it and um yeah so let me have a look at the chat if you have questions about how we organize this conference uh, you yeah, feel free to chat right now uh, before the next talk started um so yeah i and also uh for people who don't know at 2 p.m utc which is how many hours from now like that's a good question. Uh, four, four hours, <laughs> four hours yeah. from now that uh, we would have a, a panel session uh, with Mark Smith and Tanya Allard. Uh, so they are both very experienced speaker and very uh, well known in the Python community. So uh, it's your chance to really um, ask them questions and, um, you know, get the chance to know how, you know, uh, how they get into, you know, uh, how to involve more in Python community. I think it ties on the way there. And this is the first time he's uh, helping out in a conference. I think it's, it's really good. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, so, yeah, if you see it on Discord, please say thank you to him. Uh, usually I would say that, uh, you know, in a conference, if you meet a speaker, if you enjoy their talk or meet the organizer, buy them a coffee. Or, or whatever drink, you know, sometimes we go to the pub afterwards. So if they drink alcoholic drink, then you can buy them a drink. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, but now we can't. We can all, only do a virtual coffee. So yeah, maybe send a coffee emoji or something uh, to the people you appreciate. I think it's a really good thing. Uh, if you meet someone, uh, you know, if, if you see other speakers, uh, they will have the orange patches. So if you like the talk, send them a virtual coffee. <laughs> send them a coffee emoji or GIF, I don't know. Um, so yeah, that would be a good idea so we still have uh just a few minutes uh, until the next talk so i think i would play the countdown thing and then after that is how you can come back in and then maybe uh you can uh introduce the next speaker or, or anything so yeah i think uh 
that's it. And it will be starting very soon. So it's your last chance to grab your next coffee or tea or hot chocolate. <laughs> okay, so I will play the countdown right now. Three minutes. So uh, we got a few comments from um, from viewers that we should uh, start more on time for that. So we're still waiting for uh, exactly 10, I think it's 10 UTC um, for the next talk. Uh, in the meantime, another, um, another message from our sponsors. <laughs>
So uh, our next talk is uh, from ha my home country of Israel. Um, it is named Why You're Getting Understandability Wrong. Uh, and our speaker, Liran Chaimovich, he is the um, co-founder CEO of Rookout. So uh, please enjoy. to you about software understandability. So my name is Liran Hamovic and I'm the co-founder and CTO at Rookout. And I'm going to be speaking with you today about this new concept, software understandability, why it matters, why it's so important, and, and why should you care about it, especially if you are writing Python code for, you know, web applications, batch processing, data processing, machine learning, and so on and so forth. So to give you a bit of background, I'm co-founder and CTO of Rookout. I'm an advocate of modern software methodologies. So I'm speaking in conferences and writing a lot about uh, DevOps, Agile, Lean, Observability, Understandability, and also a very significant background in, in cybersecurity. But that's a topic. Sorry, um, I know we didn't have audio. Uh, we're now fixing it in just a sec. Hi, everybody. It's great being here. Hi, everybody. It's great being here. Hi, everybody. Speaking to you about software understandability. So my name is Liran Hamovic, and I'm the co-founder and CTO at Rookout. And I'm going to be speaking with you today about this new concept, software understandability, why it matters, why it's so important, and, and why should you care about it, especially if you are writing Python code for, you know, web applications, batch processing, data processing, machine learning, and so on and so forth. So to give you a bit of background, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Rookout. I'm an advocate of modern software methodologies. So I'm speaking in conferences and writing a lot about uh, DevOps, Agile, Lean, Observability, Understandability and also a very significant background in, in cybersecurity, but that's a topic for a different day. So to give you some, I want to talk, before we dive in, I want to go into what is Rookout and what kind of, what makes me an expert on the topic. So Rookout is a platform for live data collection and debugging. Using Rookout software engineers, much like yourselves, can set non-breaking breakpoints and anywhere in their code and see stack traces, variable values, anything they want on the fly. And they can do that as the code is running remotely. So essentially, you pick a line in the code, you set a non-breaking breakpoint, and you see uh, this line is being hit on that server. This is the server that's calling it. That's the stack trace, variable values everything you would see in a traditional debugger. And the thing is, working with our customers, working with industry analysts, we've come to realize that uh, debugging is not about going and fixing something that's called a bug in Jira. There is so much more to debugging in debugger than just fixing bugs. Whether it's those bugs that you find during development process, but even more so, it's about understanding your own code. It's about releasing a new feature and then uh, setting breakpoints to see what's going on, to see, the, to see how the flow is 
executing to see how the code is being hit, to, to observe. It's about being able to take a look at a piece of code before you change it, so that you know what's going on and how to modify it. And this is all very critical and very basic to how we write code. And in, in a way, that's what understandability is about. Being able to understand our own code, be, being able to comprehend it. And so think, think of it like that. Uh, let me give you a very simple, very straightforward example. I'm sure all of you know the JSON module within the Python standard library. And all of you guys had the experience of taking an input file, uh, parsing it using the JSON parser, and then verifying it meets a certain structure or extracting a few attributes from it. Now, this is a task I'm sure you can get done in 10 minutes, maybe even less, or tell you, take this file, extract those other attributes, and let me know if it meets a certain structure. But what if I were to take that same concept, that same file, and I were to ask you, go ahead and validate that input within a very complex system, within a very large system. All of the sudden, what you're thinking of is how well do I know that system? Because if you don't know it well, then it's a nightmare. You have to go through all the code repository, maybe multiple repositories. You have to go through the components. You have to figure out where is that piece of data going through in the flow? Where can I make that change in the flow? What can I do about it? You have to think about stuff such as how do I make that change? What are the performance implications? What are the stability implications? What's the best place for maintainability, for backwards compatibility, for forward compatibility, and so on and so forth. Now, if you understand the system very well, if you were there from day one, if you were the one to write it in the first place, then it's probably not, still not going to be a trivial task, but it's going to be much, much easier and much less intimidating if you understand what's going on. And, and that's what understandability is about. When we understand the application we are working on, then we can deliver high quality features very, very fast and avoid bugs, avoid pitfalls. While if we lack in understanding, everything is gonna be messier. Now, obviously, if you've been there from day one and if the system is reasonably small, then of course you can understand it. But understandability is about how hard or how easy it is to understand the system. It's not just about how easy it is for you to understand the system, but it's about how hard would it be to someone else from your team or to a new recruit you have to onboard, or to someone else entirely. How hard would it be for him to comprehend the system and get things done? And that's gonna make a huge impact on the team's productivity and on the value you deliver as a software development team. And I think being able to understand our system is so, so important because in a way, software is like Tower of Babel. There is no limit to how we can, how high we can build it, as long as we understand each other. And I really love this quote by George Bernard Shaw, saying, imagination is the beginning of creation. You imagine what you desire, you will what you imagine. And at last, you create what you will. And honestly, in software, imagination, imagination is the key to everything we're doing. Anything can be achieved, anything can be done. You just have to imagine it and make it happen. And yet, too often with our customers, with industry analysts, we're hearing those kinds of things. 68% of organizations experience flying blind or flying slow, meaning we fail to live up to those expectations. We fail to live up to our imagination because we can either fly blind we can either not understand the system, which happens in many large organizations. We just don't understand it. This, this is a piece of Python code that was written, I don't know, 15 years ago in Python 2.2. We ported it to Python 3. Nobody knows what's going on. It's using an archaic web library. 
and so on and so forth. And, and we just don't understand it. And so we make changes and we pray and we hope for the best. But everything is slow. We, go, we, make, we are going in the dark. We are blind people in the dark. So we are making very small changes. It's very risky, very high error rates and so on. Or we can go slow. Uh, we can just add five log lines before every change. We can make uh, two hot fixes. We can release two versions that are just to get more logs before and after we make a change so that we make sure we don't break anything. We're going so, so super slow just to make sure we keep track of what's going on. Now, both of those options are very, very bad. And that's what happens when you don't have understandability. Now, if you were to have understandability, things would be so much better. And we've defined with the help of industry analysts the term of software understandability. We draw from the concept of financial understandability. If you're not familiar with it, uh, I'm sure all of you have your uh, finance providers, finance service providers, insurance funds, uh, pension funds, insurance companies, and so on. In the past, those companies sent regular reports to their consumers, and those reports were unreadable. All bunch of numbers, everything is messed up, very hard to read. And so regulation came into play, requiring those financial service providers to provide the reports in a way their consumers can comprehend them, so that they don't use obscurity as a tactic to rob their customers. And drawing upon that, We've defined software understandability. Understandability is the concept that the system should be presented so that an engineer can easily comprehend it. So to, as I said earlier, understandability is about how can you, how can other software engineers comprehend whatever it is you're working with? How much failing to understand the system is blocking, is blocking your path forward. And before we try and define understandability, we're going to do that in a second, describe the criteria for understandability. Let's take a step back and think about a software application. I mean, what is a software application comprised of? What is your Python application, whether it's a Django web server or a TensorFlow machine learning, whatever, comprised of? So first and foremost, I'm sure all of you are going to say source code. Because we are software engineers, our job is supposedly to write code. So it's all about the source code, right? Well, source code is definitely a very important, maybe the most important part of an application, but it's far from the only one. We also have the configuration and state of the system. Whether we are storing that state in, in memory, in, as variable values, dictionaries, whatever, or we are storing that state in a Redis database or a Postgres database, whether we are keeping lots, of, we have configurations that those can be environment variables, it can be stored in file or in memory or as feature flagging. But all of those elements have a huge impact on the functionality of the system, on the behavior of the system. Think how many uh, bugs can be resolved by restarting a laptop or by clearing the browser cache. And that's so much is determined by configuration and state. And we have to understand that as well. Now, another element is the runtime environment. I mean, the same piece of source code might behave very differently if it's running in Python 2 or Python 3. Uh, it might behave very differently if you're using a different database with different locking primitives. Uh, even more, the same piece of code might be very accurate, very a great piece of code for a single threaded application, but might be work very badly if it's a multi-threaded application or if it's an active active deployment and all sorts of things. And so we have to keep that into account as well. How is the code being deployed? How is it being run? And we have service dependencies, whether we're using third-party monitoring tools, uh, third-party billing tools such as Stripe or even first party other services within our company, all of those elements make up the application as a whole. It's not just about our small repo and what's inside of it. 
And last but not least, of course, the inputs and outputs of the system are critical, 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 critical. I mean, how are users using the system? How many users are using the system? Are they calling those endpoints with JSONs or XMLs? Are those end endpoints being called once a second or 10,000 times a second? Is the buffers, are the buffers we are processing, or the files we are processing, 100 bytes files, 10 megabyte files, 10 gigabyte files? That, that's, those are all going to make huge differences. And only by understanding all elements of the system, the source code, the configuration and state, the runtime environment, the service dependencies, and the inputs and outputs, only by getting all of that as a whole do we truly understand the application we're working on. Now, in order to understand the application we're working on, we, we have multiple criteria, and that the information that needs to be available for us. So first and foremost, we need information to be available, all the information. So if you're working with source code, we want access to all the source code. Now, I kid you not, we, I've met customers where source code access is regulated and not all the engineers have access to all the source code that's relevant to their day-to-day -day jobs. I mean, of course, they can do their jobs without getting access to the source code, but it's, it's gonna be harder. It's gonna be harder to understand what's going on. And far more common, it can be very tricky to give engineers access to production databases, production configurations, because there you have security, privacy issues. And I, I'm not dismissing those issues. Those are real issues that have to be tackled. But if we don't provide our engineers, if we don't prov provide, if we're not provided the information we need, then our jobs just gets harder. I mean, fixing a bug for a customer when you're blind, when you don't know their configuration and state, it's that much harder. Now, the second element you have to keep in mind is conciseness. So it's great I have access to 100 million lines of code in multiple Git repositories. It's awesome I have access to 100 billion uh, database rows with all the information I might want, but I can't go over all of that all the time. I need some degree of conciseness. I need a couple of pages of introduction about the system. I need a summary about the database, about, for instance, the list of tables, the purpose of the table. Uh, we need to, the information needs to be provided in a way that's easy to consume, that's easy to get started. Now, as we go ahead and shrink the data, we have to make sure we keep it clear. The information has to be clear, has to be provided in an easy to read manner. Uh, some stuff is obvious, such as comment, comment the code, keep it clean, but it's also about the documentation and everything else. It has to be high quality. And last but not least, we need the information to be organized so that I can zoom in and zoom out. I can read the intro page and then I can move to the intro to this page for each uh, component. And I can go from, I can go into the API. Like, you know, the IDE features, find the references, go to function, go to definition. That's a great, those are a great set of navigation features. But we want the same about how do I get from this, how do I have this code in front of me. How do I figure out what's its product configuration in production? How do I figure out what are the inputs in production for this specific function? Those are great questions that we need to be able to answer. So how do we move between the various components of the system and the various dimensions of the system so that we can get a full picture of what's going on? Now, if we have all of that, if we have our information in a complete, concise, clear, and organized manner, then that's also, awesome. then we know what's going on, then we understand it. But if we don't have all the information we need in that manner, everything becomes so much harder to understand. Now, as I'm working with many customers, many prospects, many in the industry, and first hearing on, on, about understandability, many folks think of different things that are 
closely related to algorithm scalability, but they are not the same. The first of those is complexity. Naturally, a complex system is harder to understand, but just because a system is complex doesn't mean it can't be understood. And just because a system is simple doesn't mean it's easy to understand. Let me give you a quick example. I'm gonna provide you now with a Python script. Let's say 50 lines long. This, I'm gonna tell you this Python script, its purpose is to read a file and provide an output. Now, on one side of the spectrum, I can provide you that script that has no documentation, no comments in the code, no inputs and out, no input or output examples, and I'm just gonna say, go and figure it out. That's gonna be difficult because you're gonna have to try to read through the code, synthesize uh, inputs and try to figure out what's going on. On the other side of the spectrum, I can provide you that same script with a document, let's say two pages describing what's it doing, some comments in the code. I can provide you with some input examples showing what are the expected inputs of the system as well as their expected outputs. Now, all of a sudden, the task that I, I described that might have been a research task, figuring out what the script is doing, which is, you know, could take a few hours, maybe more, maybe less, depending on complexity, becomes a task you can achieve in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, just read the documentation, go through the code, run the script with a few examples, and see what's going on. So even though the system is just as complex, we didn't change complexity, I provided it with a set of tools, more inf essentially more information to make the system more understandable. And that's critical. The second element, understandability is not readability. Naturally, a piece of code might be very readable. And it might be, uh, the, maybe the code was written in very clean code, well documented, and the code is very readable. But maybe I'm not making that code available to all the engineers for security purposes. Or maybe the engineers have access to the code, but they don't have inputs, input examples. Or they don't have state examples. So just by a piece of code or a document being readable doesn't make the system as a whole understandable, but it definitely helps. And last but not least, observability. As I'm sure many of you are aware, Observability has become much of a trend in DevOps and SREs. Observability is a term that is measuring, can I see, can I understand what's going on inside the system? Do I know the state of the system by observing it from the outside? Now, observability generally measures a very simple element of the system, request rate, uh, error rates, latencies, and so on. And observability is about letting, uh, letting software, uh, letting uh, site reliability engineers or waking up in the middle of the night, know if the system is good or not. And if, if something is wrong, what is wrong about it? As I'm sure understand by now, understandability goes much deeper. Understandability is about how the system is doing what it's supposed to be doing. How do, what is the correct place to add this feature? Why is this bug showing up and so on and so forth. So of course, observability data can be can help us under, to, with understanding the system. And of course, understanding the system can help us design better observability. The two are not the same. And so definitely complexity, readability, observability, those are all uh, close neighbors and we should seek to optimize them. And they all deserve their own respect, but understandability is quite different. So I'm hoping that by now you've got, a, you've got a sense of why understandability is important, why so many of the problems you've faced in the past could have been resolved through a better understandability and why you should seek to optimize it. So let's see about how we can go about that. What can we do to improve understandability of new and existing systems? So first and foremost, we should minimize complexity. Now, there are many ways to minimize complexity. One would argue most software engineering is about minimizing complexity. So let's go through the obvious options. Cut back on requirements. Whether we are dealing with functional requirements, such as what the system can do, and non-functional requirements, how the system is doing it, 
Non-functional requirements are often trickier, but they include stuff such as performance, stability, availability, security, and so on. Each of those requirements make a system more complex, often exponentially more complex. The fewer requirements we have, the easier our target, and usually it's gonna resolve in a simpler solution. Now, hire the best developers. Better developers are gonna find simpler solutions to the same problems, which is gonna result, in, obviously, in a system that's easier to understand. Utilize the highest level building blocks by using more advanced versions of Python, by using a web, higher level web frameworks, by offloading database management to your cloud provider, and so on and so forth. You're essentially giving up some of the complexity of the system. You are handing off some of that responsibility to somebody else, to the interpreter, to the cloud provider, to whatever. And so your, your, your solution ends up being simpler. Apply software engineering principles, domain-driven design, clean code, drive, and so on and so forth. If you're gonna write better software, if it's gonna be simpler to understand, everybody wins. And last but not least, practice agile and DevOps. By building your system step by step, you're probably gonna end up with a simpler system with less over-engineering and more uh, practical knowledge of what's going on. Now, I'm sure none of those five requirements are gonna shock you. I'm sure everything mentioned here is pretty straightforward and you've had a chance to think through it. But before we dive in, I wanna share another thought with you. So everything I mentioned here, uh, while maybe not trivial, it's definitely stuff you can and should do when you're building a new system. Unfortunately, when you're working on an existing system with an existing team, cutting back on the requirements that have been made, decided on 20 years ago, that's hard. And even if you do get to cut, cut a few requirements out, and you're not gonna re-engineer the system from scratch in a day. So all of, all of those tools are great for uh, keeping creating a new system that's simpler. We, it's much harder to minimize the complexity, to remove the complexity from an existing system. And so we are better off with many of the other options I'm gonna show you for dealing with complexity, to dealing with poor understandability in an existing system. And so that leads us to knowledge. The more we know about the system, the easier it is to understand it. Knowledge starts with learning. Go ahead and learn about the system as much as possible. Uh, interview your colleagues. Grab a cup of coffee with previous colleagues who have left the company. Uh, read the source code. Go through the databases. Sniff production traffic. Go, do whatever you need to get as much information as possible about what, what's going on. And write it down for yourself so that you remember it. I mean, the more you know about the system, the better it's gonna be, hands down. Once you've learned, document. Write down what you've learned for your use and for other people's use. Build presentations, build a wiki, a wiki page, uh, whatever it takes and then share that knowledge uh, record sessions such as this have internal meetups have team meetings uh, share the knowledge share the knowledge you have and encourage the, the team around you to find and fix any mistakes you might have made to keep things updated as they change and to collect knowledge as well and contribute it. And the more knowledge you have as a team, the easier it's gonna be for you to handle the system and the easier it's gonna be for you to onboard new employees to that environment. The next item on our list is development environments. By building high quality development environments, we as software engineers have the pleasure of a playground. We can pick the application apart, we can put it back together, we can attach a debugger, we can see what's going on, we can experiment. And experimentation is a great way to learn, it's a great way to 
that we uh, build and test new features and so on and so forth. So what do we have to do? What do we have to do so that we can have high quality build environments to use? So first and foremost, we need to replicate the tech stack we're working with. So at least some of the development environments should be, as, every development environment should be as close as possible to the production environments. Uh, and at least one of them should be very, very close, as close as humanly possible. Starting with get this, obviously get the same operating system, get the same Python version, get the same dependency version, which is obviously trickier. So think about using uh, locking requirements to a file, uh, building uh, immutable container images that are easier to run in multiple environments, and so on and so forth. Use the same cloud resources, you know, just get uh, your development environments in line with the production environments. The closer it is, the more you're gonna be able to learn from it. Now, use high quality test data. Obviously the best development environment in the world is gonna do you no good if it's sitting idly by with nothing going on. You need high quality traffic going into that system and whether you take that from production or you synthesize it or God knows what, uh, yeah, it, it, it's difficult. It's not trivial to get it right, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge you have to take care of. Uh, get high quality, replicate configuration from production to staging, replicate data and databases, replicate traffic, do whatever you need to do. And last but not least, Keep in mind that you have to manage environments a bit. As you add new uh, services to the production environment, you to, as you add new technologies, you need to add those to the development environments as well. As you add new, as you add new APIs, you need to add the configuration states and inputs for them to the development environments as well. And even if you are not changing anything, maybe the business is going into new markets. Maybe your users are changing their behavior patterns. You have to keep track of that and make sure you, you have up-to-date, high-quality test data in development environments. Now, in the world today, the biggest challenge to development environments is the sensitivity of the data. For most of us, the data we are working with in production environments is sensitive data for security and privacy reasons. Most companies have limits on how data can be transferred from production to development purposes. And so it's a big challenge. How do we remove sensitive data from the core of the data without, make, without losing its value? Can we synthesize data? Can we buy data? Can we pay customers to work in non-production environments? It's a challenge, but one you have to face if you want to go down that route. And uh, there are some benefits for getting it done. Then we have observability tools. As I mentioned, observability tools are all about seeing the innards of the system, but seeing the state of the system. Observability tools include stuff such as logging, tracing, metrics, and error tracking. Now, all of those can provide you with some insights into what's going on in the system. And so first and foremost, I recommend every company, every team that has those tools deployed, make sure each and every developer on the team has access to those tools. They're gonna provide you with insights into what's going on. They're gonna provide you with data points. Where is the code flowing? What is being called? How often? Well, the errors in the system? and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, the big uh, downside of observability tools is that they only show you the outer side of the system. They show you stuff. They show very well the uh, external APIs of the system and they have limited visibility, provide limited visibility into the business logic. You can add as many logs as you want uh, to the business logic itself, uh, but that's a tedious process. You add logs and then you find they're too uh, noisy and you have to remove them. And every time you change uh, the visibility, 
you have to release a new version. For some company, that's going to mean a few hours. For some company, that's going to mean a few weeks or a few months. But either way, it's a process. And so while observability tools provide you with great insight and great value into knowing what's going on in the system, they're also very cumbersome and fairly rigid and static. And you can't just tune them on the fly to answer the questions you might have. Now, last but not least, we have understandability tools. Understandability tools are just that. They are tools that are designed from the ground up to help us understand our code, to help us understand our application, and to enable us to do our jobs. So anybody has a guess about what's the first understandability tool? So the first understandability tool is the traditional debugger, because that's what it's all about. I mean, think it. A debugger allows us to see our application running, in, okay, even in slow motion. It allows us to stop at arbitrary points, see exceptions being thrown, and know every step of the system. How is the code flowing? Why is it flowing from A to B? What's the input over there? What's the state over there? We get full access, full visibility. We know everything. Unfortunately, debuggers can't be used in all environments. Uh, they can definitely be used on our laptops, uh, as long as everything is working well. Once we start uh, putting in some other technologies, containers, Kubernetes, serverless, they might not be as easy to use. In certain development environments, traditional debuggers can be used, but in others they can't. So things become a bit messy, and they definitely can't be used in production-like environments, let alone production, because debuggers, by the nature, destabilize the system, slow it down, and are a bit of a hassle. And so this, this brings me to tools such as Rookout, next generation debuggers. Debuggers that are production grade, that allow us to uh, go into our code anywhere it's running, on our laptops, in the cloud, in containers, even in production. And using non-breaking breakpoints, we can answer any questions about the code. How often is this, is this line being called? What, what inputs is it being called with? What state is being read from the database for this user? What's the configuration for that account? We can answer all of those questions arbitrarily by, no, by selecting the piece, of, the piece of code you want answers from and just setting a non-breaking breakpoint, getting the data and truly understanding our own code. Now, both traditional and next generation debuggers have their strengths and weaknesses, but I believe that over the next few years, we're gonna be seeing more companies use a mixture of both to uh, empower their engineers to better understand the software they are working with. So I wanted to thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, I know the topic of understandability is very close to heart. Uh, we are finding this is making a huge impact on many organizations we are working with. And I'm hoping you have enjoyed learning a bit about it. I would be happy to continue the conversations on Twitter or on our website. So please reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. And then we are super excited because we will have Tanya joining us. And yeah, Tanya is a developer of a course from Microsoft, and she's going to tell us something about Jupyter Notebook, which I'm super excited. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. So let's welcome Tanya. Hello. Hi, Hi how's everyone? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that, yeah, I can see your screen. So, yeah, just take us away. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm going to start. Uh, is, yeah. Hello, my name is Tania Lard, and as my friend Terry introduced me, I am a developer advocate at Microsoft, and I'm going to be talking about getting started with Jupyter Lab extensions. Um, for those of you that don't know me, this is me. Um, you already saw my screen 
uh, my wallpaper, sorry. So you can tell that I am a bit obsessed with all things outrun um, and retro aesthetics. Uh, I'm also a Python Software Foundation fellow. I love Python. I work mostly in the machine learning data science ecosystem. Um, and I love mechanical keyboards as well. Uh, so if anyone, I tell it all the time. So if anyone wants to talk about mechanical keyboards, uh, please hit me up. Or if you want to reach out for anything about my presentation, you can find all of my contact details at my website, that is trialart.dev. And also something that I, probably everybody knows is I love JupyterLab. Um, but more than that, I think I, I just love the whole Jupyter ecosystem. Uh, over the years, I think I have named myself the unofficial advocate for Jupyter uh, because I still have to find um, like a presentation or a tutorial in which I don't mention something of the ecosystem. Um, and something that I really, really appreciate of the whole Jupyter ecosystem and interfaces and tools is that everything is extensible, everything is stackable. Um, so the best thing, the best way to think about how the Jupyter ecosystem is put together is thinking about Lego blocks. Uh, if you're familiar with Lego blocks, you know that you all have certain pieces that are common in certain shapes, colors, um, and with those with those stackable pieces, you can build pretty much anything you want. Um, and that is like very low key, the same principle of Jupyter Lab. They give you those stackable pieces, um, and then they empower yourself. Well, they empower all the users and developers to build on on these amazing building blocks. Um, so probably a lot of you have, might have heard about Jupyter Notebooks, um, but I'm talking about Jupyter Lab in this presentation, which is the base, uh, the web-based user interface for Project Jupyter. Um, so if you uh, work locally, for example, on Jupyter Notebooks, what's going to happen is you're going to do uh, Jupyter Lab, start your server, um, and you're going to have this, a web browser tab or, or window open. You don't need to have internet connectivity um, for you to able uh, for you to be able to work locally, but it also allows you um, to talk to other remote uh, machines or other computers. Um, and Jupyter Lab is uh, pretty much the evolution of the original uh, Jupyter Notebooks experience. Um, it it has moved a bit more towards an IDE approach where you can have uh, your terminal, your notebooks, uh, text editors. You have like a nice sidebar, top bar. I know that a lot of folks uh, still like the more traditional or the original interface because it was very clean and you could have like a single notebook without uh, a lot of the extras. But I found the Jupyter notebook is is really nice. It's real extensible. Um, and one of the reasons <laughs> people are going to ask me, like, why would I even want to write an extension? Um, one of that is there are many ways in which you can bring, uh, for example, programs or tools that integrate with Jupyter Notebooks, but if you or with Jupyter Lab, but if you develop an extension, you're already giving them something that works on top of their stack and their favorite tools. Um, so you're already reducing the adoption barriers. They are already going to be familiar with the stack, uh, with the whole environment. And also a nice thing is that it is self-contained. So it can be directly installed, linked, and activated within uh, Jupyter Lab or, or through the command line. So you have to eliminate, like in this way, you eliminate additional baggage and, and you allow folks to focus on the real problem. As I said, like in my very, very first presentations, uh, the whole Jupyter ecosystem is built on the premise of extensibility. So having a combination of lab, uh, Jupyter Lab plus a lot of extensions or a number of extensions, it allows you as a developer or as a user to create new editors and output, visual, output visualization. So if you need something that needs like very, very high vis or um, special output, then you can do that um, and outsource it to the world. Um, you can also pretty much customize um, 
add buttons, add menus that will make your uh, experience and your user's experience or your community experience much better. Um, and also, uh, on a more backend side of things, you can also provide APIs for other extensions. Um, and one of the things that, uh, one of the extensions that I really like that has this approach is an extension called Kaylee, which basically allows you to run uh, Jupyter Notebooks directly as Kubeflow uh, workflows or pipelines. Um, and that is like, it's like magic because uh, when you're developing on Jupyter Notebooks and then you want to, to move that into Kubeflow, you have to do a lot of manipulation sometimes. Um, and then you have to keep two sources. Like you can you can convert your notebooks, of course, using um, NV, NV convert, um, but it's like extra overhead. Um, but it, what this extension does and what other extensions does very well is provide APIs to other tools or ex extensions in the open source ecosystem. Um, what else? From the practicality or usability, uh, I've already mentioned that if you have an extension in Jupyter Lab, you can run it locally, you can run it on your own machine, um, but you can also run it on somebody else's machine. Um, if, for example, your company or your university um, has a cloud provider using something like Azure, for example, you can deploy your Jupyter Hub and allow everyone in your company to access it um, and have like that nice interface with all the extensions. Uh, again, it aligns with the broader ecosystem principles of extensibility, empowering um, the, the whole community through open uh, tools and open infrastructure. And although we are now seeing that pretty much any IDE has its own flavor of support for Jupyter Notebooks, um, for example, VS Code now has like a real good support for Jupyter Notebooks, um, Jupyter Lab and like the vanilla Jupyter Notebook uh, interface is still one of the most popular interfaces for users to interact and work with uh, Notebooks. So um, how do you even get started? Uh, I imagine that for a lot of us that are not so much into the front end stuff, but are more like back end data science, machine learning kind of folks, um, it all seems like so complex uh, because it is a web-based tool. Um, so what are the major hurdles that you're gonna experience? And I'm gonna tell you about my own experience. I thought, well, I'm decent ish at doing front end stuff. I know like TypeScript. Um, I know a bit of like different frameworks. I know how to connect back end and front end. Um, so this this was my expectation, right? Like I know Python, I'm familiar with Jupyter Lab, I'm familiar with Notebooks, like how hard can it be? Um, and this was my reality. This was my my experience when I first wanted to develop my extension. Like what what like I, I I couldn't make a sense of a lot of stuff. Um, and this was because I, as I was going through the documentation, as I was going through my setup, as I was doing like um, following even some examples, um, I had all of these questions. Like, do I really need an Anaconda? Like, it is, is this more like front end -y? So why do I need an Anaconda? Um, how much JavaScript or TypeScript do I need to know? Like, I didn't know TypeScript. TypeScript enough to write VS Code extensions, for example, uh, but I'm by no means a TypeScript or a JavaScript uh, expert. Um, also, I was like, okay, so how do I even get started? How do I understand how all the, the small building blocks fit into the Jupyter Lab? Um, and, and, and where can I find more information about these components? And I think my personal blocker, especially because I've, I've said it a lot, I'm not a front end expert. Um, I could not find that many practical examples in the documentation or using my search for skills. Apparently, my search for skills are not as good as I think they are, um, but I couldn't find a lot of uh, practical examples out there. Um, so I did uh, go through. Uh, the documentation through the tutorial, they have a nice tutorial for an astronomy um, 
what is it, the NASA picture of the day extension. So as soon as you open Jupyter Lab, you'll see an extension there. There are a few examples. Um, but something that really, really helped me was uh, going through the code of other extensions that folks have been creating before, uh, especially, especially Jeremy Tulop. Uh, I love his code. Uh, he has written some really, really, really nice extensions. Um, and that gave me a lot of understanding on, on how everything is put together. And some of the nice things that I notice is that in general, uh, like the, the Jupyter ecosystem does encourage code, code, good coding standards. Uh, most of the extensions that I found and the examples uh, and the sample extensions that the team has out there are, are very clean, well-documented code so I can follow through. Um, in general, extensions are a mixture of Python and TypeScript. Um, so it's not just TypeScript, uh, type, and TypeScript is actually quite new. It, it's actually, sorry, quite nice. Um, and it also makes it very nice for folks that are more on the UX side of things um, to, to, work on, to work on. It makes it nicer and easier. Um, and there are also a number of cookie cutter templates out there. So uh, you don't have to build everything from scratch. You can start with a nice template. You can start with a nice directory structure. Uh, and I always appreciate that because that is extra overhead that I sometimes I don't want to deal with. And the good is once you get your development workflow and environment, you actually get into a nice development uh, workflow and steps and you can make use of um, like watch and live reload so you can actually see your changes reflected. One of the, well, some of the problems that I actually found when working uh, or developing extensions is that the, the build times can be very, very long. They're, they're quite slow. Um, and this is because it's a multi-step process for you to be able to build your extension, relink it, and then you have to build Jupyter Lab. Um, although there are cookie cutters out there that makes the initial uh, starting point easier and more seamless, there is not always, um, I'm sorry, I just need to check that. Um, it doesn't always mean that it's going to be super easy to have a, a, a finished, oh, I don't know what I wrote container, a finished uh, extension or finished product. Um, and also, Man managing dependencies is hard. I know this is uh, hard already in the Python ecosystem, but then we also have to deal with other uh, dependencies um, because of the front end component. And it is, uh, you have to be very careful, especially to allow compatibility across the different versions of JupyterLab. Um, I can't remember exactly when we migrated from one point something to two point something, um, but now also we have the release candidate for Jupyter 3.0 uh, out. Um, so again, managing those compatibilities uh, is, can be a lot of pain. So if I've kind of uh, now started started to giving you a bit of uh, interest in developing your own extensions, here are some tips that I've learned from my own experience and talking to others that are actually much more experienced writing uh, Jupyter notebook extensions. Independencies, and I say this all the time again, it's not just for reproducibility um, and for collaboration, but also I recommend uh, pinning all of your Jupyter Lab dependencies in your package.json. I'm going to go into this a bit, a bit more, as well as the version of Jupyter Lab required in setup.py. This is going to so, uh, help you with a lot of headaches. Uh, it is very easy to accidentally break compatibility. Um, if you don't pin your dependencies or your versions, and like even small changes uh, in the package can lead to massive chaos. Um, as it happens, uh, you're going to eventually find that uh, your Jupyter Lab packages in package.json will not be truly compatible in terms of sub dependencies. 
so make sure that you are using the resolution section of the package.json to force uh, these packages to use certain versions for uh, interdependencies. Um, uh, oh, interdependencies uh, agreement. And this is briefly the, this, these are briefly the steps that you're gonna uh, feel um, gonna follow us as you're developing your extension. Uh, you first are gonna need to create a code environment. There is there are ways around it, but actually is the most straightforward way to do it. You're gonna then need to install your server extension locally. Um, so that you can actually work on it and reflect the changes. Um, then you're going to have to build your TypeScript components, which is the front end side of things. Link your extension locally to your Jupyter Lab um, so that when you start your server, you actually uh, can access the extension as well as the main Jupyter Lab uh, web served uh, front end. You then need to build Jupyter Lab and there might need to be additional steps depending on your extension, depending on what it does. For example, if it's an extension that talks to other APIs or other tools, you might need to do authentication um, or other stuff on the back. So, um, and actually the, the steps uh, from build your TypeScript components to the other things are steps that you're gonna be constantly doing. Um, and as I said before, the problem is that this takes so, it can take so, so long. Um, there are many ways in which you can actually do the build, um, but I found that the two that works the best are using Conda for your environment uh, and Yarn to build the actual TypeScript components because it overall reduces the time. It's quite intuitive. If you are already familiar uh, developing uh, some JavaScript-based projects, it just works out. Um, also, the Jupyter Lab, uh, sorry, the Jupyter Lab um, team have worked on JLPM uh, that basically will give you some commands similar to, to Yarn to install all of the dependencies. Um, all of the dependencies build your components um, and actually have enable a watch mode so you can see in live time uh, the changes to your extension. Um, and the nice thing is that they already have a code environment that, well, code environment specification that from which you can create your own code environment. It will add J, um, JLPM and you don't have to worry about uh, like other nuances. So if, if you're thinking about uh, using, like getting started with extensions, I recommend you using any of these two approaches for, uh, for you to build them. Um, I have noticed if you're familiar with NPM, for example, uh, it, is, it is the slowest. And I found a lot of issues uh, when trying to build my extensions. And the next step is I've already given you some tips on how to get started, what you need to do from the practical and technical side of things, but let's familiarize uh, us a bit with the stack and with the actual workflow that you're gonna need. Um, so the first thing is when you go to the, and, and I, this took me a while to figure out, uh, when you go to the Jupyter Lab GitHub repo, uh, you're going to see so many, so many, many, many directories with a lot of coding of, of scripts and files inside them. And the reason is um, that this is a monorepo. So it has all of the components and all of the different bits uh, that, that you need to bring together the whole Jupyter Lab tool. Um, but if you are developing ext extensions, the two main uh, directories that you have to look into and where you're going to find actual things is JupyterLab, which is the actual backend code. Uh, this contains things like handlers, uh, handlers commands, debugs, um, well, debugging capability extension setup and the such. Um, and in packages is where you're going to find the core extensions, meaning all the extensions that are in built in JupyterLab. Um, so there's like applications, utils, code editor, notebook, and so on. Um, so this is what you actually uh, need to familiarize yourself with uh, to start building your extensions. 
Um, as I mentioned before, you're going um, to, you can, if you follow the tutorial or go to the development guide, uh, the easier way to get started is creating your Conda uh, environment. Um, there is also something uh, that I forgot to mention when I was talking about dependencies and dependencies resolution. When you're doing this, limit your Conda channels uh, because this will also significantly uh, improve or reduce the times of your build. I just tend to, to stick to Conda for it, and it works as nice and as easy as, um, as it can be. Then the next step is using cookie cutter. Um, don't start from scratch. I totally recommend using cookie cutter because it gives you a nice scaffolding. Um, there is a cookie cutter for extensions in script, extensions on vanilla JavaScript, uh, one for themes, and I think there is another one that I can't remember. It might be widgets. Um, but it gives you this nice scaffolding where things are already where they have to be. Uh, it gives you a starting package JSON that has all of the internal um, Jupyter Lab applications imports, so you don't have to worry about that, and that's like super nice. Um, and once you have that, then the next step is to actually install your dependencies, build a TypeScript source, and leave your development version of the extension with Jupyter Lab. Um, as I mentioned before, I've been using Jarn. Uh, it works. It's nice. Uh, I don't have to worry. Well, sometimes I just leave stuff building and then go make a coffee, come back, and it's all done. Um, and again, Jarn, uh, if you are, have been using it for front-end stuff or like developing apps or stuff, um, you know that it comes with a watch uh, functionality or watch command. So, uh, so as you're making changes of your ex on your extension, you can actually uh, see them uh, in in a live reload. Now, if you remember, I talked about these core extensions uh, that are within the GitHub repo, uh, and this always they this have to be specified in your package.json, depending on what type of extension you're working on. Um, so you have application app, app, app utils, notebook, and Lumino. Again, make sure that you are pinning all of the versions um, to ensure compatibility of the sub dependencies as well as with the version of Jupyter Lab that you are using and targeting. And there you're going to find in the cookie cutter, if you go to any other extension, that you're going to have an index.ts file in the SRC, and that's where all the magic happens. That's where your whole extension code is going to live. Um, and that's where you're actually importing those uh, those dependencies like at Jupyter Lab application, Jupyter Lab notebook, Jupyter Lab uh, Lumino, for example, depending on what you're doing. Um, and this index, uh, this is an extension object that runs everything. Uh, this is going to do all of the functionality of your app. So make sure that everything is contained there. Um, and then just like some some, some guidelines, um, because we're working with both Python and TypeScript, and of course, uh, like CSS files or SAS, um, make sure that all the TypeScript files are in SRC. Uh, I've had in the past problems saying that something doesn't uh, exist or I can't add components, and that's because I forgot to put everything in SRC or reference to where those files were. Uh, keep everything tidy in place. Uh, I don't, for example, I, I prefer using SAS um, for uh, styling sheets, uh, but you do need to have all your style sheets in CSS. Uh, so what I do is I compile SAS, generate CSS files, but make sure that everything is in style, um, that you're using the import, uh, uh, sorry, and that you're importing them directly in index.css, uh, because that is going to create the whole um, HTML HTML file for for Jupyter Lab, and um, if you are adding icons or images, stick to SVG. One of the reasons being that SVG is scales very nicely, um, regardless of the resolution, the size, and stuff, and keep everything in icons. 
And finally, um, one of the things that has helped me a lot um, when building sessions is actually using continuous integration and continuous delivery. I use GitHub Actions uh, for this because it allows me to keep everything self-contained. I have my repo in GitHub and so my actions. So I have an action that does all of the building, does the testing of um, everything in um, sorry, in my extension, and then as soon as I create a tag, then all I need is as well my npm token that is for, well, for example, for some extensions, I need an npm token because they're going to live there, um, or I can build whatever kind of installation package you need, and I don't have to worry about that. That's a, that's a step less uh, that I have to worry about that, but it also allows me to test different um uh, uh, different platforms and different um, build environments. So I hope that this has given you a bit of an idea on how to get started with Jupyter Lab extensions um, and just like some some good practices. And if you want uh, me, if you want to reach out for further resources and how to get started uh, or examples, please reach uh, reach out, get in touch. There is my website and. I think I went over for a minute. That's okay. Thank you so much, Tanya. It's an amazing talk. So yeah, I'm afraid that uh, people will have to find you on Discord uh, for further discussion. And also, uh, you will be back on stage at 2 p.m. like three hours from now, right? So I will. Uh, yeah, make sure that you come back and you can ask Tanya more questions during the time then. Um, so thank you so much, Tanya. I will let you ha have a break right now. And um, our next speaker will be uh, Alastasia. And uh, she's very experienced with Python. Uh, she has seven years of Python experience and she's going to teach us something today. And welcome to the stage. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm super happy to be here. <laughs> Yeah, so you're going to uh, teach us something about uh, beauty and the beast, <laughs> yeah? Yes, exactly. That's why I'm wearing this pajama. Um, I actually found it uh, on, uh, online and I'm super happy to have like some parts of the Disney movie in here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when you're ready, you can start uh, share your screen and you can take us away. Okay. Yeah, so it's about decorator and I'm not sure whether you like or dislike decorator, but I think it will be a very interesting talk. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And yes. Take us away. Oops. I think. Yep, we are seeing uh, your yes, now. Desktop. Yeah, this is the slide. Yes. Okay, take us away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, this talk is about Python decorators. And um, I would like to ask everyone, um, what do you think, whether the decorators are like the beauty or the beast? So in this talk, um, at the beginning, um, I'm appearing as a beauty, and then at the end, you will decide uh, whether decorators are the beast themselves or uh, the beauty, and I'm the beast fighting uh, the beauty at the same time. So um, to start, a few words about myself. Um, I'm a lead developer at Scout B in Berlin. I moved to Berlin um, around four and a half years ago, originally from Ukraine. And I'm also one of the organizers of Pi Berlin Meetup. Feel free to join it. It's also all online. And I have around 10 years, or maybe now it's a bit more, in software development and seven years in Python. And I'm super happy with this community and also with the conferences and super excited to give my talk to you today. So before we begin, um, if there would be in-person talk, I would usually ask the questions at the beginning to find out where we are. Um, so I, I will still ask the questions and uh, you can answer them in the chat or maybe like for yourself. The first question would be, have you used the creators in your code before or maybe now or maybe you were familiar with them. And the next question would be, have you written a decorator yourself? And the last but not least would be, do you know how the decorators work and why they can be dangerous? So the most important question is the last one. And I want you to focus on, the, on this question and get to know more about decorators, how they work, and why should you use it and why shouldn't? If you want to 
follow the code snippets, which I will show later on. Uh, feel free to join this uh, GitHub repo and, and check it out because I will show some demos in the end. That's exactly the same code, but without explanations. So let's start with the basics. I was looking on the internet, something about decorators and um, everything as an object. And I found this question on Stack Overflow and it's saying, I constantly see people state that everything in Python is an object, but I haven't seen this thing actually defined. So let's first define this thing, what is an object in Python. And we will start with a small example. We have a function which is called say hello, which is printing something um, on the screen, like hello and then the name. We are uh, going to run it with the say hello pajamas and also we will use another function, my funk, which is supposed to do the same, right? Like we are assigning my funk to say hello and then we are trying to say hello, awesome pajamas. So let's focus on, on this particular part and then we see how we go from here. So we can see on the screen, everything is perfect. Everything is working as expected. Two functions did exactly the same because they're supposed to do the same. Then the next example would be, we are trying to delete the say hello at first. Interesting, right? Like you don't really know, or maybe you know, and um, let's see how it goes. We have the same result. like. I don't know, for me, it was a bit unexpected. Um, this was the question uh, at one of the meetups uh, to me. And as a speaker, I didn't know the answer. So I said, well, I need to run it and see how it goes. So I started digging deeper. Why is it happening like this? And actually, the answer is that everything is an object. So let's say we're trying to print the function name of this new function, which is supposed to be say hello, which we just removed. And we will see on the screen that this is actually is say hello. So now the question transforms a little bit. Why is it happening like this? Why the my function is the say hello right now? So the answer is super simple. Everything is an object. And this is the thing <laughs> that we found out right now. So the say hello is the function itself. It, it does something. And the say hello is a variable as well. So when we remove, when we delete the variable, we delete the variable, not the function. If we don't assign the say hello function to another variable before removing, we will lose it, but it would be still somewhere. We will not just be able to call it. So the, all the functions in Python are first class objects. And that means that they have all the properties of first class objects. That means that you can assign the function to a variable. That's what we did in here. You can store functions in the data structures. You can pass them as arguments to another functions. You can also return them as a value from another function. And uh, we will take a look how does it work with decorators. So then now we are starting um, exploring the decorators, what, what the decorator is in Python. The decorator is a callable that takes another function as an argument, the decorator function. Callable is something that we can call. It's not only the function, but uh, also could be a class. So types of decorators, they were introduced pretty a long time ago. The first one was uh, function decorators and it was added in Python 2.4. Then there were class decorators uh, in Python 2.6 and now we are at Python 3x, right? So really, really long time ago. And still uh, not everyone knows how they work. So let's take a look um, into function decorators. The basic function decorator would be looking like this. Let's take a closer look. We have uh, the decorator itself, which is called my decorator, and we are using it with a syntactic sugar at. So we are decorating the function, which is called my func. The second example, which you can see below, does exactly the same thing. It does uh, decorate the second function with the same decorator. So it's just a matter of showing it, um, of using syntactic sugar or just doing the same thing, assigning um, to another function. 
The wrong way of using decorators uh, would be, I mean, not the wrong way, but a bit more confusing if you assign decorated function, which is not the same as the function you had before, not to your name, which in this case, my second fun, but you will assign to another name. So then you would have one more function instead. Then there are also stack decoration, decorators. Uh, you can uh, use them one by one first and then the second, and then it would be the same result as if you were doing it one by one, like you can see in here. So if you're confused, how does this work? Which one would uh, work first? Then feel free to write it in this form and uh, this would clarify a little bit. Then class decorators. The basic class decorator would look like this. We have a class, and then we're using it as a decorator to decorate a class or a function. We can use class as a decorator for a function. So the previous example was class as a decorator for a class, and this would be um, a class which would register every enter to the function. Um, pretty simple, pretty interesting, and let's dive deeper into examples. So now it's a demo time and I will show you some code. Um, there is a trick. If you use decorators, for, for example, uh, like normal decorator, uh, it wrapped the, the function, it's trying to print something on the screen before and after, and then uh, the function is pretty simple, just returns some value and then prints something on the screen. So if we run this function, um, the interesting part in here that we want to check is the name of the function. So my func is the function which is being decorator, decorated with the decorator, which is supposed to print before and after. So we should see before, right? Looks good. Then we should see a result of the function in here, right? Then we should see the exit after, and then we print it on the screen a um, couple of names. So the first name would be the name of the function, oops, the name of the function, and the second would be the doc string of the function. This function, which we're decorating, has a doc string, right? So we were expecting to have it. And actually, it's not like that uh, because of the way how the creator works. We are um, actually receiving the wrapped function name, and then the doc string is none because the wrapped function doesn't have any doc string. And then the value is value, which is correct. But um, the problem with this is that we really want to see the function name and we are getting some weird name which is wrapped, it could be something random. Um, there is another decorator, um, instead of writing it yourself, feel free to use this decorator, wraps, which will um, put, like reassign all the um, correct namings for the function and for the doc strings. And yes, we have my func, which is the good name, the, the name that we, use of the function and then exactly the doc string that we had. So problem solved, right? Um, feel free to read more about this decorator. Uh, you can also go and uh, check the code of the reps. What does it do? Now you know how the decorator works. So it's pretty safe to use it because um, no matter what, um, you have to keep in mind that the decorator can change the behavior of the function. For example, we just uh, decided not to call the function and then we will return, I don't know, uh, none in the end. So in this way, the decorator would, would change the behavior of the function completely. Then it would do some random stuff instead. It will not even call the function and then it will return and other random stuff. Of course, this is not an intended result uh, for everyone and um, you have to be careful of what you are decorating with which decorators. Um, so I would suggest you to either check the code of the decorator if it's written by some third parties or just select uh, trusted third parties. 
Um, another example would be how to time um, execution of the function. So for this, we want to use our own written decorator. Of course, of course, you can use existing ones, but this is more for visibility. What does decorator do? Um, we have a simple function which sleeps for one second, and we want to print the result uh, uh, of, of the sleep on the screen. Um, so basically, we want to see that the function worked for one second in here, um, and we don't really know what's happening inside. Sometimes the function is the black box and uh, we need to make sure that it doesn't work longer than expected or maybe um, some endpoint, for example, was uh, slower than we expected. Then uh, of course would be easier to add the decorator instead of adding it into like time sleep and then uh, subtracting and then printing results like all of this code into every function. So we wrote one decorator, which is called time it. Um, it's uh, getting a function as an argument. And then, so this is our function coming here to the, the decorator, then uh, arguments from the function. Um, so we are printing. So we're saving the time when uh, we started uh, execution before we started execution, then we execute the function, then we save the time after execution, and then we subtract them and just print in a nicer way. Also together with the function name. It looks good, right? We have a time in decorator and we print this function three times. We expect the outcome to be one second, one second, and one second. One, one, one. Looks good. What if we don't know what's happening with the decorators? We could maybe do something different. For example, this. Um, would it be different? Probably not, because this is the outer scope of the function. So this would not really affect the time inside of the um, function, of the inner function. But if we do something like this, So we try to uh, start recording the time in here. Then we have this timer, sleep one second. If we do it like this, I bet we would not see any difference in the first run. So in the first run, um, we have one second, right? We're calling this function three times. Um, this looks a bit weird because we are trying to record the time at the beginning of the decorator. Then we are running the function. So this time between uh, running the function and um, starting the outer function should not be different, right? But no, on the first run, it's one second. There is no difference. But on the second run, there is already one second from the previous uh, execution. So the trick in, is here is that the time in the curator is starting the count, this count, exactly when it's being used. So when it's being important, imported. When we import the timer, this one, it starts calculations. So then we call the function once, and it is already one second. Then we call the function twice, there is the second second, and then we call it third time, there is a third second. So if we do it like this, then uh, of course there would be a sleep time before. So there is no quite a difference uh, when you sleep in this inner inner part. It would be executed uh, in the import time. Keep that in mind that this decorator uh, is already recording this time. So if you want to use it for a different purpose, feel free to start counting from here. But if you want to count the function itself, I don't recommend to use it like this. 
So the best um, option would be to actually record the start and then the end of the function. There is also a way to uh, use a timing decorator for a class. It's a really long example and I'm not going to show it right now because it will take a lot of time. So feel free to check this, this example also uh, more examples in here. And there is also late binding example, which is not only about decorators, it's uh, more in general, the concept. And um, I once had a question, how does decorator works for a recourse, for a recursion? Like if there is a recursive function and you wanna use decorator with it. There is nothing really special about it. You use the decorator for this function. So you remember at the beginning, I told you that the easiest part, the easiest for you at the beginning would be to write it without the at sign. So the uh, usual form, you just um, have the function, then uh, you use the decorator in here. My typing is, is really terrible and super slow. Um, so you use the decorator to decorate this function, right? So this would be exactly the same. And this would help you to understand that we decorate not only this one function, one call of it, but all the calls of this function. So in this recursive function, uh, we run it once here, right? We run this function and then it will run itself and then every time when it will run itself, it will um, call the decorator. So if you wanna check it out, you see how many times was it called? So exactly uh, all the times when it was calling this original function, every time it was calling the decorator. Their own version of the decorator would be something super confusing. For example, you can, uh, as I showed on the first option, if we want to decorate the function, which is called f, we can use decorator and then assign it back to the function f. But if you change the name of the result of the variable to which you assign it, then of course the result would be different. So if you um, use the decorator, for this function as a syntactic sugar at or uh, in the correct way like this, then in the recursive function, it will be called as many times as the function is called. So when it's calling it itself, if you use it in a different way, you assign it to this variable and then you call this one. So actually inside this decoration, the, the function would not be decorated. So only this one would be. So this is the difference. So um, I recommend you to read documentation about decorators and then try it out. Um, the more times you try uh, and experiment, the, the more knowledge you gain. And last but not least, I have um, something interesting for you to share at the end. If you want to learn more about decorators, uh, more examples and more interesting uh, things to try, there is a really good talk from EuroPython in Basel from uh, Ruven Lerner, Practical Decorators. Uh, I think he's showing like five at least examples. I just showed once with the timing um, and there is uh, way more to come. And also everyone loves peps, of course. So I looked up uh, how many peps were about decorators. So the main one was when um, decorators, uh, function decorators were introduced in 2003, three, then there were class decorators in uh, 2007. And then there was a bit more information in 2011. And then the latest one is from February this year. And of course, um, I should know about this because I'm giving the stocks, but actually I was not up to date before I prepared the stock. So when I searched, I realized that there is something new uh, released uh, for the decorators. And this last one is actually showing that there is a bit, a slight difference um, of the naming uh, convention for the decorators. So feel free to use it, to read it. And it's, it's 
quite interesting. Um, and now the question to you, what do you think now after what I showed you and I told you, are the curators in Python beauty or the beast? Feel free to drop me a message um, and I would love to hear back from you. What did you like about the stock? What you didn't like? What could be improved? Um, so you can uh, drop me a message uh, in my Twitter account or maybe via my personal blog. There is uh, an email in there. Um, and uh, feel free to use all the tutorials from the repo. And thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much. And um, so we have one question in, oh, I'm very, okay. So uh, there's one question in the chat that want to ask uh, when to use decorator and when not. Um, so when to use decorator, when you want to use the same function, um, the same actions, I would say, and multiple functions, for example, like time decorator, um, your, your boss is coming to you and saying, I want to time uh, all of the functions that we have. And we have like 250 functions. Of course, writing the code would not be an option. So the decorator would be a good option. Um, also for the class, you can uh, use decorator for all the methods of the class, which would be useful. So if you have the use case when you need to um, do some actions, um, I don't know, push something into the database uh, or um, some other actions that are recurring for all the functions, uh, then I think it's a good idea to use the decorator. Yeah, so uh, I think that's all the questions that we have for now. But yeah, of course, like uh, you already share your contact detail and people can talk to you and maybe you can hang around in Discord and people can uh, have discussion with you there. So thank you so much, Anastasia. It's a really good talk. I will let you go right now. So um, our next talk is going to be a recorded talk. So our um, speaker, uh, Dean, has uh, recorded the talk for us. So it will be about Clippy for Python. So yeah, it's very exciting. I've I never heard about Clippy before. So uh, let's hear this talk right now. Hi, I'm Dean. So uh, back in the 90s, if any of you know this character, this is Clippy. He used to be a personal helper for uh, Microsoft Office products. And uh, he's not remembered very fondly. He was kind of annoying. But it brings up the questions. Maybe we could create some kind of helper now with modern tools that could actually be useful. And also, could it be helping us with Python? So uh, let's start with the story. This is, uh, this is me. And this is Belle, my friend. And we like bird watching. And uh, we like bird watching so much, so we decided to go out and take a log of the bird. So you can see on the right, this is uh, an object. This is a pandas object. Pandas is basically kind of like an Excel for Python, for those of you who don't know that. And we started writing. And at each point we've seen a bird, we noticed the timestamp. So at 2 o'clock, for example, we've seen an Elang Jawa, then we've seen a hoopoe and a wagtail, and some more bird. But then we got home, and we wanted with, this, this wasn't enough. We actually wanted to see this kind of table wanted to see at each hour, how many of each bird did we see? So I wanted to take the previous uh, table and turn it into this. So I think you need to know about Belle. She's very smart, she's talented, she's hardworking, but unlike me, she she's lacks experience. And she was the first uh, to go for the test and she can do anything basically. If she, if she gets some tests to do, she will do it. I think it, because she's unexperienced, there, there are maybe some things in the Pandas API that she's uh, not familiar with. But she, she starts, she, she's not afraid of, uh, of some of those tasks, and she starts, and she's writing all those lines of code, and this, believe me, gets the job done. The thing is, it's very long, and uh, it has some things that she cannot overcome. She needs many lines to overcome on some challenges. And it's very hard to maintain, basically. So if she comes back to this code in two weeks, she's like, what's happening here? Now I get to the task at hand, and I, I know of some... Um, methods that Bell doesn't know about, like resample and unstack. And um, this is my code. Th this is doing the same, basically. Those both sides of the same are doing the same job. Question is, wh why do you need me, right? Wh what if there was some kind of clippy character that can tell Bell, hey, notice that when grouping by time step, consider using resample. Now, this is the first time uh, Bell knows about resample. 
let's try and see if we can actually write that kind of helper. But first of all, a bit about me. So my name is Dean. I, I'm a data scientist. I work for uh, Sentinel One. Uh, Sentinel One is a cybersecurity company. We have uh, many tools uh, based on machine learning to actually detect threats on the on our customers' uh, endpoints. I'm also part of Data Hack. It's a data for good organization in Israel. We are promoting data science in Israel in many ways. And also, I'm the creator of Dove Panda. Dove Panda is exactly what we're going to talk uh, talk about today. It's a kind of like a clippy characters that helps you write better and more concise uh, pandas code. Today, we're going to, not going to talk specifically about Dove Panda. We're going to see. Um, I want to talk to you about some internal Python uh, tools that we can use to actually use pa uh, use Python to change Python. So let's start with the notion that uh, in Python, everything is an object. What do I mean by that? You can define a function. It's called my function. It gets an x and returns x plus, x plus 5. But then, because everything is an object in Python, what you can do now is you can say f equals my function. And what, what you get when you say f over 5, uh, you get 10, right? 5 plus 5 is 10. Awesome. Now you can say my function, so the name my function equals to 1. My, my function is a function, so let's try and uh, run that. And my function of 5, what you get, type error, int object, is not callable. Well, so what, what, we, what did we do? Well, my function is no longer a function. It's an int. But what do we get if we say f of 5? We still get a 10. So basically, there's a function. There's a function object that we've given new names to, right? It's not, it's not anymore called my function. It's called f, and this is it. But that's because everything in, in Python is an object. But you should handle this with care. Why? Because you can say len. Len is a built-in function, right? You can say len equals 5. And when you're trying to see what's the len of pyjamas, you would get type error. Int object is not callable. So you can actually change built-in Python functions to do anything you want. Specifically, you can make it destroy Python. But we'll see how we can do it to actually do nicer stuff. Let's start with hooking over a function. So basically, uh, how this helper works is that the helper sees a function. And the helper wants to run that function. but the helper also wants to run another function before that. That's called hooking. Now, if you build a package that uh, actually expects hooking, there are many better ways to do it. But now we have functions that we nobody ever intended for them to be hooked upon. But you can see how we can do that. So let's start. What can we do with hooking? Let's say original len equals to len, right? So we have a, a function, and we call it original len, and it's doing this currently. It's doing the same as len. But now we can define another function, other function, it gets an object. First of all, it prints something. Len works on lists and strings and will not work on ints and floats. And then return the original len. Why do we return the original len and not len? Because now we can change len to say what's the len of live. So it will print for, as you see in the third line. But first of all, it says len works on lists and strings and will not work on ints and floats. Why is it good for us? Because later, when we get some more complex function, this is actually a personal helper. It's doing the job. It says what's the land of life, but it also teaches you something about the function. So let's check what's the land of five. So type error because int has no land. But before that, it says the same thing. And you can read, will not work on ints and floats. OK, now I understand why type error, why I got the type error. Let's do another one. Let's attach hook on uh, math.cosign. So from math, we import the cosine and the pi, and we say original cosine equals to cosine. We define another object, uh, write some uh, message to the screen, and uh, we return the original cosine. Now we say cosine equals other cosine. We check what's the cosine of pi, and, the, and it says the message cosine works in radians, not degrees. This is, this is now becoming nice, right? Because not all the people know that. Of course, it's written in the documentation, but not, many, not all the people bother with that. And, you may get unexpected results, but if the helper used to uh, would actually say that on the screen, that would be a lot clearer. But what now? Now uh, we're still writing the code. Now we're 200 lines later, many, many minutes later, maybe even days. We got again to our code, and now we say original cosine equals to cosine. We define another cosine. Cosine equals other cosine. And what's the cosine of pi? Hmm, that's strange. It first of all says the message that we want, but then it's endlessly writing the previous message. Why is that? Because original cosine equals to cosine. It's not, or it's not actually the original cosine. It's the one that we used to do before. And we get a recursion error because it's always running the same, uh, uh, the first other cosine. 
So what can we do? Let's let's keep a ledger. So we have Bell. She's uh, trying to write those uh, hooking function, and we have me, and I keep a ledger. So uh, Bell can come and say, "Hey Dean, did I already hook on cosine?" And I say, "Yep." And if I say, "Yep," she says, "Cool. I'll just use it again as the the original cosine." But now she will say, "Hey, did I hook on sine?" And I say, "Nope." So she says, "Okay. So this is original sine. Take it. Keep it in the ledger, and I'll now use it. But if I come again, let me use it again." So how do we do that? So we import cosine, sine, and pi, and we have the ledger. And now we say the string cosine, what does it keep? It keeps the function cosine itself and what and sine the same. How does the ledger look like? Exactly as you would expect, cosine, and now it holds the built-in function cosine. Why is it any good? Now it can define an original func that, that gets a name and returns the function. So if we ask for original func of cosine, we get it. So now Bell can write code. She says original cosines is the original function of cosine. And now she's doing some things with the messages. She's hooking over a function, and it works. And now I come. I also want to hook over cosine. I do the same thing, but because the, uh, the cosine is in the ledger, I just get it, and it works perfectly for the both of us. So what do we do now? We just need to import math, and then from math, build a ledger of everything that's in math. Right, the string cosine for cosine, the string floor for floor, the, the string factorial for factorial. But that seems kind of hard, right? It's it's manual. There are many, many functions in the math model itself. It's bloating the code, right? You need to write it somewhere. We may not use all the functions. If I want to only hook over ceiling and floor, I don't need a ledger with all the rest. And it requires foresight. I, I need to think what will the user want to hook upon? So is there any better way to do it? And the answer is yes. And we'll start by learning about get attribute and set attribute. Those are built-in functions in Python. And what can they do? So basically, you can get some attribute from an object. Uh, why is that good? For, for example, if uh, you want to, um, let's say you have some code that gets name of function in, in a CLI, Python will get it as a string. But you can say, tell Python, take this string, search for the function that's named that, and run it. Also, it can get it from the input function, and so on and so forth. So what can we do? We can say import math, right? Now, let's say my cosine, you get the attribute uh, cosine from the math module, get enter math cos. We do it for the pi, and now we can run my cos on my pi, and you get, that's the answer, right? Those are now the actual functions. And set attribute is similar, but different. So you say, say set attribute on math, uh, let's give it a name, let's invent something, almost pi, and it equals to 3.14. And now if you say math point almost pi, you actually get the number. So this is kind of superpowers, right? We're actually changing Python on runtime. Now almost pi is actually part of the math module. So let's reimagine the ledger. We can import math and start ledger as an empty dict. And now we define the original function, we define it again. If, we, if the name is not in the ledger keys, we can say that ledger in the string name, let's say cosine, get the attribute from math with that name. So if it didn't exist, now it exists. But if it did, exi uh, did exist, it, it's just returning the uh, ledger name. So let's say original function of seal, we get the function, the actual object of the function. And now when we check what's inside ledger, we can see that ledger uh, includes the seal object and the seal string. Now what can we do? We say the function name is seal, and we define hook for seal. It, it prints something, seal accepts float, but returns int. And now we can say original is the original function of the func name, and the hook function is the hook for seal. Now we can define other function, but now instead of printing it inside it, we can run a function. In our specific case, running the hook function is just printing a string, but later we're gonna see how we can use it to our advantage to do some more complex things. And now we just return the original. Now, instead of getting one object, we're trying to be robust for every function. So it's original for args and quarks. And eventually, we set the attribute over math of the func name with the other function instead of the original. And now, can we check if that works? So it works, math.seal of 4.5. It says the message, and then it returns the correct answer. Let's talk about decorators. So let's uh, forget for one minute about our... Uh, what we're trying to achieve, and let's just uh, learn about decorators. So let's define a function. It's called add, and it gets x and y, and returns x plus y. Now let's define a function that uh, called print args, and what does this print arg get?
gets any function. Any function that accepts x and y, because inside it we define the inner x, y. And what do we do? This function prints x is equal to x and y is equal uh, to y. And it returns a function that returns the function of x and y, right? So if we run it on add, it will say x is equal to x, y is equal to y, and return add of x and y. And eventually it returns the function itself. It doesn't return the answer, it returns the function. So now we have an object that we can run on that will compute the original answer, but will also print the message. Let's check it out. So f equals to print args of add. f of 2 and 4, it says x is equal to 2, y is equal to 4, and the answer is 6. But let's remember that in Python, everything is an object, right? So instead of saying f equals to print args of add, we can say add equals print args of add. So we override the original add. And now we can check that with add of 3 and 5, and we see that we get what we expected. So now we have f equals to some wrapper of f. And this is a very common pattern in Python. And for this, we have what they call decorators. How does it work? Instead of saying uh, add equals print args of add, we're just doing uh, at print args. And the function that will come in the next line, that's the function that we will pass into print args. So if we define again sub of x and y, uh, it returns x minus y. And if we do sub of 10 and 7, we can see that it says again, x equals to 10, y is equal to 7, and returns the correct answer. Now, I, I think you can see how it's going to relate to our code. So we, that's basically the code we've seen. But instead, we can write this code. So we, we define a robust function that has add hook, and it gets a function name. And now it's doing the larger part, original equals to original function. And now we define an inner function that says other function, and we, we give it the hook function. And now we define the inner and basically doing these things that, that we've seen. We have the set attribute inside that function and we return finally the other function. Why is it good for us? Because now we have actually a decorator at add hook. So add hook over which function? Oh, over function floor. Cool. Uh, wh what do you want to do? So we define a new uh, function which just prints a message. Uh, so let's see math.floor. Minus 4.2, so it's, it actually uh, says, uh, this could be very confusing. It says floor negative numbers may be confusing. And actually, you get the right answer. Minus 5, it's not minus 4. So now we have a cool mechanism that instead of doing all the things that we've just learned by now, once we define the hooking function and the ledger, this is it. We just have now, uh, for hooking over any type of fun function, we just need to write add hook over which function, then define what the hooking function is going to do. So in our example, we're still just printing messages. It's going to be more complex later. And we're hooking over seal, over sign, over cosine, and so on and so forth. Now let's talk about the inspect module. Uh, the inspect module, what it does, it can actually look at Python code and explain how Python code itself is working. And why is it good for us? Because now we can give the hook functions, not just printing messages. You can actually uh, switch sig the signature of what function that we are hooking upon. And then we can use it for our advantage. So now we have uh, write args. It gets args and quarks. And it prints the args first and then the quarks. And now we get, uh, let's set it upon some new function, add of x, y, and then z. But z also have a, has a default value. It returns, finally, x plus y plus z. So what if we say add uh, of 1, 2, 3? Well, it prints 1, 2, 3, but then an empty dict for the quarks. What if we say add of 1, 2, and z equals 3? Well, now it prints something else. What if we say add of 1 and 2? It prints another thing completely, but we always get the same answer, right? It runs the function, but prints something else. Why does this happen? Because it passes uh, different things in each function call. How do we solve that? Well, let's import inspect, and inspect has a thing called signature. The signature of add is exactly what's in the parentheses when we defined add. And now we can bind to it the values that we want. So if we bind to it 1, 2, and 3, we get a signature. It's a bound arguments thing with the same uh, values that we want. The nice thing about bound arguments, it could be turned into a dict with sig.arguments. And now we have a dict of the variable name or the argument name and the value. What's the nice thing about that? It, we, can, we can call bind with 1, 2, and z equals 3, but we still get the same dictionary. What happens if we don't bind z because z has a default value? Well, then we don't get z. So how do we uh, solve that? 
we tell, we tell SIG apply defaults because we have a default, we can tell the signature apply defaults. And now we can see that it works the same. So wh why should we do it? And this is the nice part. Uh, so everything that's grayed out is the stuff we've already seen. But now uh, we get the signature and we can expect the signature of the, of the original function. We can bind the args and the quads. We can apply defaults. And now call a function with a dictionary that has the variable names and the values. But why? Why should we do it? So this is the answer. Let's take another function, pow, from the math module. This is basically pow of x and y. It's x to the power of y. The thing is with a fractional powers, like uh, if y equals to one, 0 0.5, this is like taking the square root. And we, we can now tell the user a message, a, a helpful message. This happens only if they give a uh, y value that's uh, between 0 and 1. And also, when we get x that's less than 0, it says that maybe sometimes the if the base is less than 0, it may not work for fractional powers. Why, why is that? Because, for example, there is no square root for minus 2. So let's check it out. Math.pow of 2 and 4, you get 16, and you don't get any message because uh, we they weren't in the conditionals. But if we take a power of 16 and 0 0.5, it actually says taking the fraction of power is like taking the inverse root, and that this is what we see. We get 4. And also, when we do minus 4 and 0 0.5, we get a math domain error, but that's not very informative uh, message for someone who maybe forgot their cal calculus for 10 years ago. But if we have a message that's very helpful, that says uh, base is less than zero, it may not work for fractional powers. Well, now that person can maybe go to Wikipedia or ask their friend, why is it not working? Actually get an informed uh, answer. Another thing we're going to see, it's the abstract syntax tree. So the nice thing about the abstract syntax tree, and this is, I believe, is a real superpower. We can actually see how Python thinks. Why is it good for us? Because now we can create hooking functions uh, that see what the user, uh, how the user called the function, and they can actually be informed of that and try to help you uh, actually see the code that, that called that function. Let's see what I'm going, what I'm talking about. But let, first, let's see how Python thinks. So Python reads code as a tree structure. Every statement is like a moving part in a node in a tree. Let's start with the code x equals to four. And it works like it, uh, like a tree. First of all, you start with the module. Now Python C O that sign uh, operator. Okay, so this is an assignment method. What is it composed of? So first of all, it's composed of composed of targets and the value four. And now if we have two lines of code, x equals to four, and then please give us x plus three, uh, we see that the module uh, node has two leaves. Uh, and one of them is the part we've seen, and the other one is another expression. And we can see that the second line is not an, an assign operator, now it's an expression. So how can we see it in code, basically, because by now we've seen this only uh, on the whiteboard. So we import what's called AST, abstract syntax tree. And we give it, we actually give it a string of Python code. We say node equals to AST dot parse, x equals to four. Now node, contains these three objects. First of all, it, tell, it tells us this is an assigned object. We can also give ask it, give, give me node, body zero, target zero. What, what is that? You can see on the right that it's exactly uh, the things that's written on top of those squares. It says body zero, target zeros. It has name with ID X. And in the, in the uh, last line, you can see node, body zero, target zero, ID, and the return value is the string X. And again, you can do it for the value, and the value is an object that contains something that's called n, and n is equal to 4. Why is it good for us? So let's just for a second return to pandas. Uh, pandas is like an Excel for Python, and one of the objects it, con it contains is a series. A series is like one column in the Excel sheet. And we can instantiate a series. So let's instantiate uh, a series that's 1, 3, 2. And then let's sort the values. And we, when we sort the values, we can see that there, it says one, two, three, but then the index, so you get an index and the values. Uh, you see that the index kind of changed. Now the, the index is not uh, sorted. That's okay. But if we look at the S again, you can see that it uh, sorts by the index and then the values are not sorted. When we want to sort values, we sort by the values. So what can we do? Instead, we can do S.sortValues in place equals true. 
right? Because in in, before we can see that after sort values, if we didn't put it inside S once again, it didn't change. So if you're doing in place equals true, now it can change. It actually changes the object itself. The thing is that if we're not experienced in pandas, we don't know that uh, it returns none. So we actually did change the object, but now we have a new object called with the same name that got none. So when we print S, we get none. So now we have a new hook function. And in the first three lines, we won't go, we'll go over that. Both of you can use inspect from before to get the actual line that's called the original function. And we put that original function in the ast.parse. We get we're parsing the code. And now we can ask uh, Python, is the node an instance of ast.assign, right? We've seen that we have assign, we have expressions, we have some more uh, types of um, operations. So if it is an assign object, we can now look again at the args dict and see if the user pressed in place equals true. So what are we asking Python? Hey, Python, please notice if the user tried to assign the operation to a new variable and also returned in place, Tell the user to be careful because you're they are assigning none to the new object. And if we try to do it again, we can see that we're uh, instantiating a new series. If we're trying to sort values uh, without the in place equals true, Pandas says uh, Python says nothing. But if we're placing in place equals true, Python says careful, you're assigning none. That's it. That's the, that, that's the technical part. I, I hope you learned something. Let's uh, talk a bit about motivation, right? So why should I build something like it? So first of all, I can't uh, do it without talking about pandas, uh, Dove Panda. Dove Panda is doing uh, exactly what we've seen, but specifically for the pandas package. What's nice about it is that because we hooking with a function with any function, not just with messaging, we can do some uh, magical stuff, which we don't get into, but we can actually work inside the Jupyter notebook and actually use it to format uh, the message. And now this is actually a pop-up uh, message that you can actually close with the X and it actually is formatted very nicely. And let's say uh, in another example, if the user asks for concatenation of two data frames, Dove Pandas can hint that something could be uh, not as expected and would actually tell the user in which line it happened. It, it's very informed about what the user is trying to do. So you can build now basically everything on top of that. You can build maybe Dove SKLearn, Dove Requests, Dove PyTorch. And that's basically it. Let's say uh, Bell and I have a new guy in the team, and we term, use this function. We have a function that a function that's called Team Complex Logic. This complex logic gets a text and gets a classifier object from SKLearn, but also gets a protocol. And the thing is that if you use this specific classifier uh, with the specific protocol, it doesn't work. And you could you could have written that in the documentation, but once you have a combination of many uh, moving parts, it's it's becoming difficult to write that in the official documentation. So what can you do? You, what can you do? You can actually hook over that function, and when you see that those things are not working together, uh, you raise the type error as you would have in the original uh, meeting. But then you can also tell new guy uh, that you've chosen none as a protocol, which automatically chooses something some other protocol, and it does not work. And because you don't want to write all that in code, you tell the new guy, hey. Just enter the team's uh, wiki and read about, about it more. And in team wiki, we have many explanations of how it works. What also can you do? You can maybe write a white, white hat security. So let's say I write a connection string to the uh, password that we are over at the team. I actually put the password in the string. So before I'm, what, what's dangerous about that is that I need to be careful that I'm not um, like committing this into GitHub. So when I'm trying that and I'm testing, uh, Dove Panda or sorry, the other uh, hooking function will say, warning, you provided a database string that's containing a password and careful when you're pushing into public repos. Let's just uh, sum it up. So Python is superpowers. When I started uh, learning Python, I thought I could do everything. But then at some point I realized I can actually use Python to change Python itself. And what can we do? We can actually, as we've seen, we can uh, insert attribute into uh, built-in modules and we can hook over functions to do other functions and you can do you can actually the things you can do with python to change python itself this is it's endless and uh we, in our specific case we've learned how we can create personal helpers for uh, our teams and our uses to leverage python to change python behavior this is me my name is dean again uh, this is my personal website you can visit me on uh, facebook and on github 
if you use pandas, I encourage you to try Dove Panda. It will help you a lot, I believe. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. And uh, thank you for coming to my talk. Right. So, yeah, that's a very interesting talk about Clippy. And, um, yeah, so uh, we are more and more excited. And the next talk is also amazing. Uh, it's a live talk by Amand, and uh, he's very experienced. He's the CTO of uh, Twipbit. And I will uh, let him come on stage. Hello. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me clear. Yep, I can hear you. So, where are you calling in from? I'm from India and it's uh, 5 30 p.m. Uh, I just requested for, for this timing from Pajama Steam and uh, I'm super excited to be here. I couldn't find pajamas as I also mentioned on my Twitter. <laughs> I think yeah. this can also work. Yeah, that's fine. Sometimes I wear a conference t shirt to sleep, so that's my pajamas as well. I, I don't wear a conference t shirt. I'm wearing flutter, so that's like bicycle. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> With a Python spare me. That's good. So, uh, yeah, I will let you uh, start your talk and uh, take us away. Sure. So thanks uh, for attending today. And I know like it has been overwhelming with the COVID situation and you have been attending so many talks. But uh, let, let's take a little bit of step aside from your normal coding routine that you usually do and really focus on uh, something that has been very close to how I work. And as uh, Julia also mentioned, I have been also working on many projects since uh, like four or five years. And I have learned and acquired a little bit of tips and tricks on how it can help you to reduce the number of triggers you get from your project nightmares. And uh, uh, yeah, of course, I added uh, some memes. Uh, I, I think a lot of memes. So I, I leave it to you if you decide there are a lot of memes on this. Memes. So. If you are the person who is always struggling to complete the projects on time and always worry, would you be able to miss this deadline or, you know, just uh, uh, pass through? Or you are the person whose incomplete projects are haunting you in the dreams? Or you are the person who always worried about whether your code will survive the next print or not? Then my friends, I have this magic gift for you in this in this today's pajamas talk that is called no more tears from project nightmares we'll we'll talk about new methods that can help you create better projects on better time efficiently every time so a little bit about me i am founder and cto at twimbit twimbit is a research company where we use a lot of python in our back end data science and machine learning and uh, it has been always a struggle to deliver projects in time so i acquired a lot of learning because i wanted to help my team also and that's what i formed this talk of and uh, that's what we are going to discuss uh, today also, I'm a lead at Mobile Web Dev, which is an open source community for mobile and web technologies, a little bit off track from Python. So I do mostly mobile and web development and sometimes Python. Also, I'm a uh, member at deeplearning.ai, Andrew NG's uh, machine learning and deep learning initiative and also open source initiative. I was a former research engineer at TU, uh, Technical University Vienna, where I did my recommender systems uh, training and research. And that helped me actually learn a lot of lessons of how to build projects at scale. Uh, and to sum up everything, I am a mentor, uh, entrepreneur, hardcore entrepreneur, and uh, advisor to many startups. And uh, feel free to connect with me, drop your comments. And if I said something, you know, that you think might be mistaken or not 100% accurate, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll be happy to take your feedback and improve my talks. So let's start. First of all, let's focus on three main things that will be key to complete all these things that we are going to cover in the future. So consistency, efficiency, and expectancy. We expect to uh, for our projects to be always consistent. It shouldn't be like sometimes you're testing it's working and sometimes it's not. We expect our projects to work efficiently on time on resources without using a lot of uh, you know wastage of money or resources and always expect to do things as they should work so these are the three main things that we are trying to solve so first of all let's go through the little bit of talk agenda that i have prepared we'll see what's actually going wrong what's the problem that's causing so many tears in project nightmares uh, we'll also see how to plan a project, which can help us uh, in, in the way of uh, starting to solve these problems with project management and nightmares. Uh, also, we'll see how you can set up your environment, 
both in terms of your project environment and also your actual physical environment where you work and then how you can start optimizing your project so that it doesn't uh, create issues in the future we'll also talk about how to move towards a final delivery date and how to create a checklist of things that can help you uh, make your project deliver better and at the last we'll recap in a small three slide way of what we uh, just did in this whole talk so even if you missed some of the details i have the slide put on on my blog i'll share the link also with you feel free to you know just relax stretch your legs in your pajamas and just you know be with me think through as much as possible without worrying to take notes so let's uh, come up with the first po point that's what's actually going on to explain this problem i'll take you through a small graph that i prepared so this is a graph between time versus anxiety shame or fear these are more relational and correlated things what happens in a usual project uh, story is that we expect anxiety shame or fear to reduce as the time elapses because you know the project is getting over and everybody is like okay now we'll be able to deliver it but in actual things are a little different you know when you want to start the project, like you have the actual date, now you are free, you have acquired all the knowledge, but suddenly you don't do it. And this leads to increase in anxiety, shame or fear. You are starting to question yourself whether you will be able to complete the project or not, uh, whether you have the right resources to complete the project or not. And then finally, you actually start doing the project. So that procrastinating monkey inside you is now relaxed and you have actually set, settled down to think about the project and start working on it. But what happens is crisis. Things go wild. Your anxiety, sometimes you are able to solve things, sometimes not. And you are like in this fear, like what's going to happen, even I'm going to complete the project or not. And this is what we define as hell zone. This main hell zone is something that we are going to tackle through this whole talk. After this, the things get pretty easy and you are able to get back on track with the project, but you have already wasted so much time and confidence in completing the project. So this is the main time that we'll be like discussing today of how like, we can fix problem with this health zone. First of all, a code that I always love and always try to introduce in project management talks from DHH, creator of uh, Ruby on Rails, uh, that person should focus on creating half product not half assed products it's okay to not uh, add all the features that you are thinking in your mind in one go but at least not release something that's half tested or like working in like fragments so with that let's start with the first point which is leading to the problem that's poor planning of course everybody knows this poor planning is like fixing things as they occur you haven't planned you didn't knew about uh, if this thing is going to happen or not so instead of focusing on completing the project on time you have been always in that rescue mode okay i let me fix this let me fix this and like keeping everything to the track but that doesn't work all the time also some of the problems uh, are because of thought clarity you haven't thought through about the idea of what you are going to do in the project uh, pretty much like and every person in your team has a different perception some of them think that they are trying to construct uh, this uh, you know tree with a ladder thing and the customer has explained something different but you know you get the point like everybody has a different uh, opinion or perspective of what they are actually trying to build this cause a lot of problem because every time somebody realizes that they have, you know, they were doing something wrong, it's like taking a step back and doing it from scratch. The same thing didn't apply, uh, you know, for all these uh, different things that people were expecting. So it's very important to bring that clarity. Also, a lot of folks, uh, especially me in the beginning days, were thinking like, ah, I don't need tools. I can use normal Python ID or uh, just that, uh, you know, the out of the box notepad things that I can use, but that are not, unique, you know, the best approaches uh, because it's okay. Some people don't know about them. It's not their fault. Some people even know and they think that it's overwhelming and ultimately what it does, it leads to wastage of time and, you know, what not with this silly guy. And again, another problem that a uh, lot of folks have been talking around uh, me these days is premature optimization. And I was like pretty much shocked. What, what, 
uh, what's premature optimization so basically thinking too far thinking about scalability overwhelming project and scope even if you are not at decision making level you should make your team and the decision maker realize that uh hold on wait a minute our app is not going to get 10 million hits in a day or like uh, you know that kind of scalability that we need or it's not that uh you know somebody would just make a single decision oh my god this is better than netflix then definitely we should use it people take time to take decisions and things take a little bit of uh you know gradual approach when it comes to acquisition of customers so you don't need to really think about scalability and that's what premature optimization actually means at the same time we were thinking about scalability and those kind of optimization but what optimization we didn't thought at all was things like if things works don't touch it which uh, is uh, from the silicon valley code uh, and then things don't run constantly of course because you haven't tested it quite well and uh, the basically the person who is writing the code uh, especially of the young people who are coming to write the code they are having a different view of how things work on server they are they, they, things are working pretty much fine they have their 4 gb ram laptop and their intel processor works fine on their laptop on localhost but as soon as somebody goes to install the dependency and everything things code filed sometimes tensorflow is not supported and things like that so those are also some of the things that leads to project nightmares at the last moment so now let's move towards solution. I hope you have already understood that what's the point of actually attending this talk. So let's talk about how you can work on to reduce the amount of tears that you can get from projects. So the first thing is talking in diagrams. Now, you remember the first point that I talked about. The main problem of project nightmares is that everybody doesn't have clarity. And clarity can be only brought if you talk in diagrams. So you don't talk with words you don't explain stuff okay we have to create this no you have to like create diagrams in order to explain everything on paper so that you have well documented well practiced well celebrated document which everybody participated to create a good picture of what you are trying to build now the benefits of doing this thing is of course it brings clarity it confirms that everybody is on the uh, same page avoids possible rundowns because you know every element of the project uh, helps in like you know plan resources also how much time you would need how much developers you would need and things like that now i have been huge fan of diagrams.net a free tool to actually create diagrams and you should definitely check it out if you haven't before all you can use other tools like miro also but diagrams.net is free it saves things in your google drive you can export the diagrams and all that and you can create uml uh, user manipulation language it's used to create those diagrams which contains the flowchart like this one or you can just create a diagram that just explains what's actually going on with the project now it's, it's also important to define how much uh, planning or how much diagrams you should create so it's it should the main agenda over here is to make a clarity around the project not actually figure out each uh, tiny inputs and outputs constraint that your project might have so it's it should be enough to get everybody around also it should be made with collaboration if you are the decision makers it's good you you take the charge but here you might do a mistake again our main goal of creating diagrams is to bring clarity in the project so it can be only done if everybody in the project participates in the diagram making process so you explain create notes of what should be done and then everybody should contribute to okay i think this is the module here is where it should go with the output or this is where we need another page this is where we need another uh, kind of cron job functions things like that and that's i think a better way to do it and it should be uh, regularly talked about. It shouldn't be like uh, you created the document, then it's like just a sticky page in your office diagram or just like a wallpaper or screensaver. But it should be a document that you regularly talk about. You you come to a weekly checklist, how, however you want to do meetings, and you come back to that diagram and see, okay, yeah, we have discovered this one. Uh, this was a wrong approach, and this uh, this bit we have. Done. So talking about these diagrams again and again, keep everybody, everybody uh, on the track. Also, details are not necessary in, in terms of uh, defining each individual inputs. And run a dry simulation of how things would look like if this is a real project. Like, are we anticipating all the possible scenarios in which a person would use this project uh, so that the product uh, product experience is also a function that you have anticipated before working on the project? That also avoids a lot of last minute changes. And of course, if you're a, a 
team of marines you know how to do this well but if you're not then let's keep going now let's start with how you should actually create a diagram so the simplest way is first of all explore an example project uh, it's okay for you to think that you are solving a novel or unique uh, problem but lot of uh, lot many of time i have discovered the problems that we are trying to solve has been already done by someone so it's always a better option to compare and explore similar projects that you are trying to create and see how they came up with the solution to these things some of the problems that they have already encountered won't be encountered by you so you are actually it's not uh, it's like copying like a master not like exactly replicating and being a thief so it's a good approach smart approach so you don't repeat the same mistakes that other person have repeated then start by adding main elements of the project like how your landing page where this will fall or where you would put a database or like uh, if you will have a central processing query system or an endpoint at this place so start with adding the main elements of the projects then specify the inputs and outputs these are basically the lines that connects two modules and defines okay this is from where we'll get the input and this is where we'll go with the output now lay down each tools if your system requires external apis or external documentation or external tool lay down on this chart so that everybody has a better idea of what skills they need to acquire or what things they would need to go through before actually going to start the code so that step wouldn't encounter when they actually start working on the code and add then start adding all the connections between these third party external apis now next important part of after creating the diagram is how you should team up and this is pretty much uh, well known with any experienced fellow but new buddies like uh, people in my team don't know about how to actually team up so this these are pretty much some of the do's and don'ts whatever you do just follow these do's and don'ts it would help you a lot talk regularly with the team it shouldn't be like you create a silos you don't assign things and then just like fire and pocket okay it's your responsibility you do it but you should talk regularly about uh, the do's like, like the whole process then talk clearly uh, always clear all the doubts be the stupid guy to ask the stupid question first first of all i learned uh, from anesthesia who was also speaker in the previous talk that no question is stupid until unless you ask it so just ask it it is not stupid anymore you clear your doubts and things work pretty fine then connect efficiently with the uh, with your team connecting efficiently is a thing which is very easy to speak but very hard to implement i have been struggling a lot but now i have like almost achieved the way to connect efficiently with the team the connecting efficiently thing means that you don't take long meetings or you don't talk about unnecessary things and you only connect when it's needed so always create a calendar team calendar of when you should all connect and always write down the agenda that what you are going to discuss when that in that meeting if it's some kind of troubleshooting that you need to do or something more discussion that you need to do always write it down and if the time escapes put a timer like 25 minutes and if the time escapes schedule another meeting and always add only the people that are you know that matter to that particular discussion like uh, elon musk says if you are not participating in the meeting respectfully you can leave that would be a better option then sharing responsibility you might be the person who always want to take the heroic action and do everything but sharing responsibility doesn't only means you other persons are dividing and conquering the work but also some person are responsible for making sure that the things for that particular aspect are happening with time and consistency so always share responsibility at least uh, some kind of uh, shareable objectives that you can give to them should be done now some of the don'ts that you should definitely talk Ho hold long meetings of course nobody likes them and like people stop you know ha having their concentration on that point after a certain period of time also add unnecessary people as i already mentioned duplicate roles one person one responsibility that's the way to do it don't repeat the roles otherwise there will be too many cooks for same job and always as a project lead or a project manager try to keep the energy level of the team at the top not just like you know your college team who was very excited for the first star and then everything is like ah uh, whatever hmm next important point is predicting the resources uh why and predicting resources both in terms of uh time how much time the whole project would need if you are just a developer company still people need to know when you are trying to release something it really helps them you know get better connectivity with the product so always keep a time and also 
try to calculate how much effort you will need. The difference between time and effort often lead that's asked is uh, effort is how much time individual developer would be trying to put on to develop specific module. And time is the overall time for the whole sprint or project to complete. Also, how much some kind of servers, machines, or hardware that you would need uh, to uh, run that project this should be kind of discussed in pre uh, plan phase so that you know the person who is in charge of deploying or the DevOps person already knows and start testing out the uh, dependencies and stuff like that. Also, uh, in, in the diagram that you created, you can then start noting down what kind of skills people will need. Sometimes they need to go through the whole documentation again or just study that fact. Sometimes it just need a brush up, but knowing what skills they need in advance is really a helpful thing. Now, again, I'm not doing a project 101, but these are important things about deliverables and milestones that uh, I always try to mention, which helps to keep, uh, will help uh, keep the whole project on track. So some of the tools that I uh, have always been fond of, not a new thing again, GitHub issues to manage and log each of the tasks. Kanban tools like Trello or Monday.com or even GitHub projects is a wonderful way to log each items. Don't just use your mind to store everything. Keep it logged and documented somewhere. And recently I found this tool called as Gitcrack and Timelines. It has a free tool to create timelines of deliverables that you want to do. Again, a very UI friendly tool to uh, keep everybody updated. And what not to do when setting up sprints and deliverables and milestones is these things. Other things you can just go online and see a five minutes video of how to do sprints. They will be very, very good at that. Uh, adding too much details, adding too much things about, okay, we need to run through these many latency tests or anything like that. Just a small way of saying, okay, this is the objective and this is how we have to achieve it. Also, don't try to add long sprints. You know what happens with long sprints? People lose concentration and everything that's long, it's stupidly, you know, going to drain everybody's energy. Having small sprints gives you achievable targets and everybody stay motivated on the track. So that's the main fundamental of not having long tracks, uh, long sprints. Also, if you are not putting long sprints, also keep less deliverables so that when people achieve something, they have that gratification that, okay, you have achieved something and let's move ahead with the second step. If you have long deliverables, it will be taking more time for people to feel the sense of achievement. And thus, like everybody would be like, uh, I don't get appreciated a lot or uh, it's too hard to complete things on time, you know, and Again, from our quote from DHH, never release half features. Either do it in the next sprint or complete them in the previous sprint that you are working on right now. If you are releasing something that is half baked, you are wasting the time for that sprint also and the upcoming sprint also. Also, don't uh, you know celebrate to add on the fly changes like, okay, what if we add this kind of feature to the product or like uh, our customer would be happy to do that. No, the time to actually discuss what changes or what things you want to add into the project has already gone when you were planning and trying to create diagrams. That's what we created diagrams for. But after that, don't do it. Even if you think the product deliverable will not be able to do a good job, that's your that's your fault. That's uh, the thing that you did wrong. But the team shouldn't face that growth, right? So always create a priority list of number of issues or number of uh, you know features that you want to add and always do them on priority basis and never add on the fly changes. And of course, don't be that uh, Mr. Jack who always promises clients false timelines like doing projects in R and then you are not able to do them. Now we are almost on the last point. I think we are learning a lot and learning too much. Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me know in the comments in the feedback. So we are, what was the slide? Yeah, setting up the best environment. I, now I, in the beginning, I explained what best environment actually means, both in terms of physical environment in which your team is working and your coding environment also. So the first thing is communication, how your team should communicate. You should definitely have a meeting calendar that has already the dates decided of when is your team is going to get connected. It depends again on the sprint also. If it's like a, a three week sprint, then you should connect every three days, something like that. Something that meets everybody's requirement. And always try to keep notes attached to the meeting, even to the same calendar or you are trying to create a Google Doc or a GitHub issue, whatever tool you want to use, but always keep a note. Not everybody is attentive during the meeting. And this thing, and it's not a problem. It's not a big thing that if somebody was a little sleepy or sick, 
that he was not able to participate and attend the meeting. But these notes are like a journal that can help person to go back and see what are the things that needs to be done. Also, keep one fixed communication channel. Everybody already knows that, you know, uh, don't fragment your communication on different channels like uh, on emails or chats or on slack or whatsapp just keep them focused on one so that anybody can easily go back into the repository see what things are going to happen and what were the things that they already talked about you know and what happens when people have good communication yeah we might not have next world war three and Talking about setting up the environment, how can I forget about Git ritual? A lot of people has, you know, make my life miserable just telling them about like do this thing. So just let's follow and do this thing. Git pull before starting the project. Whenever you're, you're doing uh, going to start the project, even if you're independent team, three people team, four people team, 10 people team, always try to pull whatever was deployed when you are starting the project, when you are opening the ID. And then after every significant change or small change, please do a small commit. And then every time you're going to exit the ID, exit your shift or complete your day, push all the changes in your own branch so that you don't need to do this, please. And then talking about uh, your own environment, how can we forget about the workspace that you work in? A workspace is very important when a person is, you know, trying to build something that's going to make other people life easier. How can you expect somebody to be creating that stuff if he's himself in misery or pain? Anyways, I'm going too far, I think. So I think the first important thing is always have a nice ambient place to work. You know, something with good lighting condition, good air and everything flowing very nicely so that your code is also as ambient as your environment. Again, dual display, a small thing, you know, not a must, but definitely helps a lot in debugging and running your code in same to same things. Ergonomics, taking care of your back, very important. With good lumbar support and all that. And also not messy, yeah, of course, in this diagram, you can see my desk is a little clean. I'm not actually on my actual desk today. Last but not the least, how we can start optimizing our project. So first of all, the most important thing is the project organization. Always do the project organization in the folder space. If you are a monolithic project kind of person who is not creating dependency for other persons, always a better way to create a different set of features or different modules in different folders so that it's very easy to organize the whole project. Then don't add too much code in main script. Some people will be laughing at these like, oh, oh no, who does that? But some of these people uh, in my team and whom I worked with has done this mistake, including me, and it's like a pain. And everything should be in functions and decorators. And as you already explained about decorators, which I really love, a new thing to organize and make your code even more cleaner. And how you should name your files, functions, and decorators decides how efficiently your, your project is going to work. So always keep that thing in mind. And again, don't forget to format the comments, logs, and this thing. So this is kind of a checklist. You might have already heard from a lot of people saying this thing. and already led, read a lot of blogs about these things. But this is a checklist to again remind you, yeah, these are not just things to see, but also to implement. And if everything goes fine, the dear Python snake won't bite you. Now, requirements are required very required. I have seen people depending upon other people to just write requirements whenever they see uh, dependencies. And some of the people also love to use pip freeze, but the problem with pip freeze is that it includes all the dependencies installed on the system machine. But piprex, which is a good uh, dependency manager, only creates requirement at .txt based on the requirements that your project has used. So just a small addition to the slides that always try to use them. And always depend on virtual environment when you're working on the project. Whenever you think something might add up and something might not work pretty well, then delete the old virtual environment, create a new virtual environment, activate it, and then install the paperx, see if everything is working fine. And of course, model problems required modifications. Now we are almost at the end date, our final delivery day. This is where we'll talk about the deployments. If your project is not going to take a lot of iterations or a lot of scale, you can you are just fine with normal FTP and SSH. You can just log in with a normal CLI and you know move your project with the drag and drop option, like I use Termex or just uh, use normal uh, CLI commands 
or if your project is going to be deployed again and again worked with on a lot of people then ci cd is definitely a thing again uh, told by one of the speaker in the last presentation about the importance of ci cd it really makes the job of the developer very easy it's little complicated to set up in the first place but once you do it's really breeze and if your project is going to scale up and down with lot of people adding to the whole stack then always use containerization now the final d day plan the delivery day plan we'll traverse from our minus 10 day and we'll work towards the zero day and this is exactly to make sure that your boss doesn't seize the crashes code but the actual code that was running with you <laughs> so on minus day minus 10 we'll create a first checklist that will contain everything that's like missing even if your project is far away from the delivery day still you should create this checklist then every three days run through this checklist so everything is fine and so everything is working normally then on day minus three create another checklist with the remaining things work one thing at a time and then on day zero hand over and also don't be that person who wants to live dangerously and doesn't want to do testing so that's the end and this is the summary first thing first we need to recap uh, so less always keep less deliverables but major ables not long sprints not long deliverables small small things and also kiss keep it simple stupid everything in terms of discussion in terms of diagram in terms of you know deliverables always keep a simple explanation to everything and don't miss whatever happens always deliver on time it brings consistency build the confidence and everything is always you know consistent and thanks that's all i could create that's me aman sharma and I will be uploading slides on my blog. You can also join the discussion. Let me know what other things I can do. Thank you so much. It's a very interesting talk. And uh, I learned a lot, actually, because I'm not a management person. So I don't know like how to make things work for the team. But that's a very, very interesting talk. And I learned a lot. So uh, thank you so much. I would uh, let you relax and enjoy the rest of the talk. So thank you. Um, so, yeah, so uh, before we start our next talk, let's uh, take a quick break and uh, see what our sponsor want to uh, tell us. So um, yeah, so our next talk is by uh, Horusk. I, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Maybe you should correct me when you come on stage. Because um, yesterday uh, I was asking my volunteers, oh, do you know how to pronounce this name? It's, it's looked like a name that maybe is, uh, is not an English name. So um, yeah, so please come on stage and correct my pronunciation of your name. <laughs> Hello. Hello, that's all right. Uh, it's what is, uh, but don't worry about it. You can call me Jay. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's easier for me because uh, yeah, I, I I can only speak English and well and Cantonese, which is my mother tongue. But anyway, so uh, I know that you are giving a talk about blockchain. I think it's really really interesting. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so without further ado, let's start. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Chuk. Um, Yes, so first of all, I would like to again invite you to scan this QR code because we prepared several uh, free resources for you, you know, uh, related to Python, uh, Visual, Visual Studio Code and blockchain as well, okay? Um, all right, so uh, without further ado, let me introduce myself here. Uh, my name is Juarez uh, Barbosa Jr. and I'm an Azure Developer Engagement Lead. Uh, I work on Microsoft in Ireland. Uh, the talk today is about blockchain for Python developers. So I want to give you an overview about blockchain technology first. That's challenging because, you know, 25 minutes, uh, perhaps uh, it's not uh, the uh, perfect uh, <laughs> uh, time, time span to talk about all things blockchain because it's a complicated technology. Somehow it involves several uh, computing disciplines like uh, cryptography, security, distributed computing, programming, uh, cloud native and containers and so on, but hopefully I'll be able to provide you a big picture and also some pointers considering Python uh, development uh, for a blockchain. 
Okay. Uh, here you can see my email address and my Twitter handle as well as my um, uh, Medium uh, handle as well. You know, I have several blog posts there about blockchain and different protocols like uh, Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, we have Corda, we have Quorum, Ethereum, and so on. Uh, and the, I summarized, I would say, the documentation there. Uh, so it's just a, 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 a perfect and, and, and easy way for you to start with blockchain, you know. Uh, so I do advise you to visit uh, the and check the content later. Let's start here. I will talk a little bit about my experience. I'm a Brazilian national, uh, proudly Brazilian. I'm based in Dublin, Ireland, and I'm living in Ireland for five years now. I have 24 years of IT exp uh, of experience in IT. Uh, out of that, nine years uh, in developer advocacy and community management. Uh, mostly my experience is related to software engineering, uh, solutions architecture, and software architecture. Uh, in the past, you know, I, I collaborated in, uh, with uh, several uh, developer communities like Nokia developers. I became uh, a, a global champion, uh, let me remember, 15 years ago. Uh, also, I worked for IBM as the mobile evangelist and global thought leader for IBM Mobile and their uh, work, uh, former work light platform. Uh, I also helped them to write the very first book about mobile security, a red book. Uh, in Ireland, I worked for um, IBM, uh, IBM Watson here. Uh, and also I acted as a kind of cloud te technical rock star uh, uh, at that time. Then I joined Oracle Developers here, where I was uh, supporting the EMEA team uh, with developer relations. And recently uh, I joined Microsoft as the Azure developer engagement here in Ireland, as I said. Uh, I focus on technologies uh, primarily uh, in terms of languages, uh, Java, Python, a little bit of Golang as well, and some uh, languages that are specific to blockchain, like Solidity. Uh, in terms of technologies, I focus on emerging technologies, you know, blockchain, AI, and IoT primarily, the so-called um, exponential technologies. Uh, my experience with blockchain, just to mention, you know, when uh, actually IBM created the Hyperledger framework and, donate and contributed the code to the Hyperledger Foundation, I was working for IBM, and that's when I started to explore the uh, blockchain as a technology and a, and a protocol. Uh, and after that, I also worked for Oracle here uh, with a focus on blockchain in EMEA. We, we executed several projects and recently Microsoft as well. I have this role here where I actually um, uh, contribute and I foster the developer community in Ireland, but I also wear a technical hat and I support the team with blockchain. Um, you can see here this character, actually, that's because in Ireland uh, they uh, <laughs> say that I'm a kind of uh, blockchain hero here in the country, something that I can somehow dispute. Uh, and again, you have my Twitter handle and, and my Medium account here, so please feel free to reach out to me in case you have doubts, okay, related to my talk today. So let's start. Uh, what is blockchain, you know? Blockchain is a technology, as I said, you know, that we can consider it in the scope of this, those uh, so-called uh, emerging technologies. Uh, and it's critical con considering digital transformation, for example. Several companies now, they are trying to, I would say, transform the, their businesses and, and, and the software and the business processes, and they are moving to the cloud as well. Uh, and blockchain is interesting because uh, blockchain is a kind of database. It's not only that, you know, you can also consider it somehow a middleware component. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a different database. When you compare blockchain, for example, with the traditional databases like uh, relational databases or NoSQL databases, for example, you know, those databases, let's say we have a, a, a database and a, and a table there, the address table, and then I have my address record there. And let's say that my, uh, the, the, my house number is 45, but that's wrong. And I want to modify it, it because it should be 80, for example, you know, uh, to be uh, correct. Uh, with traditional databases, for example, I can run a SQL update, for example, and modify that record. With blockchain, that's not possible. And that's the first uh, critical and, and I would say a strong characteristic that we have in blockchain because we are talking about uh, an immutable database, you know. So blockchain, um, um, in case you have something and, and some data recorded on chain, it's impossible to modify it. And then it adds, of course, more security and one more characteristic that we call traceability. Because uh, blockchain, uh, it's all about transactions. And we, normally we uh, want to control and uh, track and trace uh, assets, uh, not only digital assets, but also we can create a digital twin, for example, and I can create a representation and a smart contract to track, uh, I would say, a container, a card part, or something like that. Uh, but given that you can't modify the record, then you can 
control, track and trace the entire life cycle of a given asset, for example, as I explained, and traceability is really important and it helps you with many things. For example, uh, let's say that you have a dispute situation, you are you have a container with um, medicines, for example, and they uh, have to be kept at a given temperature, for example, minus 10, uh, and there are some problems with that, with the sensors or, or anything, you know. With blockchain, you can then record an event and then retrieve the entire, um, uh, history about that given asset with the full traceability, and then you can prove that something wrong happened, you know. Blockchain, uh, as I said, is a, a kind of exponential technology. Uh, it's interesting when you combine it with the other technologies as, as well, you know, uh, considering uh, the uh, intersection with things like AI, for example, in IoT, as I said, you can have sensors to track things, you know, and blockchain will give you uh, a, a very secure uh, data store that you can use uh, to, to, to control um, uh, the assets. Uh, the one uh, more characteristic of blockchain, we have a distributed network, you know, and you can say, okay, but databases, we also have somehow clusters, we have maybe Java application servers, and you can have a cluster as well. But this is different because normally we have disparate companies, company A and B, and they can have their own clusters. But in case you need to perform a transaction, for example, or execute a transaction uh, between company A and B, for example, an HTTP request, and the remote node is down, for example, there's no way to complete it. You know, Normally you need, uh, in the scope of transactions and transaction demarcation, a compensating transaction on something like that. Uh, but with blockchain, all the participants in a given network they have the very same copy of a given ledger, you know, the data store. So in case you have a blockchain network with 100 nodes, but we happen to have 40 nodes, uh, you know, down as a result of an outage or something like that, uh, it doesn't matter, you know, because you still can process the transactions because we have 60 other nodes that can receive the proposal for a given transaction and process that. And in the scope of that, we also have what we call smart contracts. Um, Right, these smart contracts at the end of the day, they are also a kind of a piece of software, a software component, but it's a little bit different. Uh, I will uh, present uh, here to you today uh, the different choices that you can have to develop a smart contracts. But this smart contract, when you uh, create a smart contract uh, expressing a given business logic, for example, and you deploy it uh, to a blockchain network and it's there live and instantiated on chain, you know, it can somehow autonomously, uh, autonomously sorry, execute because you can start to listen uh, to a given context, for example, and given that there's traffic and there's a request with the valid uh, business uh, uh, information, the, the data input is valid, you can execute that smart contract then, uh, try to reach what we call consensus, uh, and that's one more interesting thing because uh, blockchain networks, there's no uh, single entity that is actually responsible for everything, as I said, you know, normally all the nodes, they participate in, uh, in that topology, uh, and it's needed to reach a consensus. There are different uh, consensus algorithms. Uh, in this scope, for example, of Bitcoin, we have what we call pool or proof of work, uh, but we also have other consensus algorithms like proof of stake, uh, proof of elapsed time, uh, proof of authority, and so on. Uh, and the, the, the last thing here, blockchain also helps with security. Uh, because, as I said, it uses the same security infrastructure. So we are talking about PKI, public key infrastructure, with key stores, certificates. Uh, and we can implement the so-called uh, triple way in security, you know, authentication, authorization, and auditing. And auditing, again, it helps with uh, traceability. Uh, so blockchain is a, a technology that's really interesting because uh, it can uh, help you also disintermediate some business processes, you know. Uh, there are several business processes where you have players, for example, where they just uh, get some data and then relate that to a given business entity, for example. But uh, with blockchain, given that everyone owns the same database and the same information, uh, you can uh, uh, remove those intermediates and expedite the business process. Uh, let's move here. As I explained then, uh, blockchain is a kind of a data store, a, a distributed ledger. Uh, and we have what we call several transactions and those transactions, they are comprised by a block. Okay, I'm going to explain that shortly. All the participants in the given network, they have the same identity copy, uh, identical copy, sorry. 
Uh, Anti-network consensus helps uh, with the situation where you don't need to wait for one given authority or one given owner of a given software component or database to actually confirm one transaction, you know? And it helps with the situations uh, related to outages. For example, we know as architects, we have uh, when you are going to design a very good uh, solution architecture, for example, it's important to address and understand what we call the single points of failure, for example. But with blockchain, as all the, the nodes and all the participants have the same database, uh, there's no single point of failure, you know. So at the end of the day, it can also help with things like, uh, you know, the non-functional requirements in a given architecture, like uh, the distributed nature of it, uh, you know, disaster recovery, failover, and so on. Uh, this is just to give you an example of different blockchain networks. And by by, uh, and by the way, you know, some people think that blockchain is only about cryptocurrencies. Of course, for example, uh, Bitcoin was the very first uh, concrete implementation of blockchain technology. Uh, but I have several examples here that you can see that actually the blockchain technology uh, and not only crypto, you know, that can be applied to several different business uh, verticals, for example, in marketing niches. So let's talk a little bit about the different uh, blockchain networks that we have. Uh, we have what we call the public or the permissionless blockchain networks, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example. Uh, they are public because with the Bitcoin network, for example, I just need to allocate one hardware, one server, a hardware box, for example. Then I can install, install the mining software and I can join the network. I don't need to be authorized to join. You know, it's a public network. Uh, it's nice. It's interesting. You know, uh, it promotes, I would say, the distributed nature of it. I, I would say to uh, its best uh, extent somehow. But at the end of the day, the transactions, they are public ones, you know. And for uh, enterprises, normally this is not a good, uh, good situation. Let's say that I want to create a blockchain network. I'm a car manufacturer, for example, Honda. And I want to create one network here as the founder. And I want to invite my partners, uh, you know, the... The, the, the dealerships, the, 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 the providers considering the source uh, of raw materials and all those, and also the customers. I can create one mobile application, for example, to give them more visibility about uh, the car they are buying, you know, and, and the entire process and, and uh, from uh, where all the raw materials are being sourced from, for example, considering, you know, sustainability and things like that. Uh, but with the public blockchain, there's no way to achieve this privacy. And that's why we have what we call on the right side here, what we call the consortium or the uh, somehow private, but uh, we call them permissioned blockchains because there are several different protocols where you can promote and you can create one blockchain network and then you can invite your partners to join that network. But in order to join, you, you, you have to give them uh, one security certificate. You have to give them uh, a configuration and authorize them to join. Okay. And the private one, normally we call it private because you can create your own uh, test network, you know, and run uh, and use it to develop your solution. Uh, so we have several examples here considering the permissionless and permissioned networks. You can see here, for example, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and uh, Litecoin, and so on on, on, the, on on the left here. And then the permissioned ones, uh, we have Hyperledger, we have Corda, we have uh, Quorum, for example, and several others. Uh, this is just to let you understand what the, the blockchain uh, structure uh, is all about. You know, we, uh, when we create a, a blockchain network, we have what we call the Genesis block, block zero. For example, with Bitcoin, block zero happened as far as I remember back in 2009. You know, and the and the and the chain size now is more than 200 gigabytes, for example. Uh, but we, with the permissioned block uh, protocols, for example, when you create a new network or a new channel, as we call it, actually it starts from block zero and it can help uh, with things like, for example, scalability, you know, because you are creating, a, I can create a channel with partners only, I can create a channel with my providers, I can create a specific channel to customers. And then uh, I would say you have more control and the blocks uh, and the chain size uh, will not be uh, so long, I would say, right? Um, considering the length and the number of blocks and transactions, you can see that a block comprises several transactions. And you can see the chain here because every block, actually it has a reference to the previous block. It's, it's a kind of linked list, you know, somehow. But that's how you can retrieve the entire information about all the transactions. And also the security is related to that because some, some um, uh, consensus uh, protocols like proof of work, for example, it demands a lot of uh, computing resources, processors, you know, and electricity and things like that. In China, we have those huge mining, massive mining rigs, for example. Uh, but it would be possible actually to reverse all the transactions in order to introduce a rogue transaction, for example. Uh, and that's uh, the security with blockchain. 
Perhaps it will it will change a little bit with quantum computing, but several blockchain projects now they are uh, also exploring quantum proof algorithms. Uh, but this is just to give you one idea about the data structure. Uh, where is blockchain valuable? As I explained, you know, so it's not only about financial services and cryptocurrencies. You know, if you think about your business process and all the use cases and the functionalities, there are ways, all the, the places where you need more security, traceability, transparency. You need to decentralize the data and promote what we call the the. the uh, the single, so, uh, single source of truth, you know, and, and, and the collective ownership of data, for example, there's an opportunity to use blockchain technology. And then we have several business verticals here. here. You can see retail, insurance, uh, capital markets, uh, Gov, digital ID, for example. There are several interesting projects related to identification. For example, the United Nations, they have one project called ID2020, one day where they want to create IDs for people who don't have a birth certificate, but also give them a bank account. You know, uh, you can visit the project uh, anyway. Uh, and just to mention this presentation, uh, uh, I'm going to share it right after my presentation, uh, my, my presentation here today. We have a, a channel on Discord, Microsoft Azure, so make sure that you can visit there and, and check out the information. I have several links here and so on. Uh, you can see healthcare here as well. There are several ways that you can uh, control uh, the information about patients, for example, uh, in a compliant way. Let's talk a little bit about one example here, Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, this is, I would say, a vastly deployed protocol and network, you know, we, uh, in the scope of a foundation created under the scope of the Linux Foundation umbrella. So we are talking about open source here. We have almost 300 uh, corporations collaborating there. Basically, all the uh, 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 giant tech companies, you know, we have banks, we have um, uh, airline companies, we have car manufacturers and so on. Uh, it's a permissioned network, you know, it's an open source protocol, of course, so you can go to uh, GitHub and download and start your own example. I have some pointers here, but it's a permissioned network, so it's good for enterprises. Uh, we have what we call the, the MSP service, the membership service. It's a kind of CA certificate authority from where you can, uh, of course, get all the certificates and the authorization to, to join the, this blockchain network. Interesting to say it's modular. So in case you are not glad with the, give, with, with the given consensus algorithm, you can write your own and plug it. Okay, so it's really flexible. Uh, the same thing with the data stores. For example, you can replay the underlying data stores and so on. Uh, you can, of course, implement what uh, I said, the smart contract, you know, the beauty in blockchain, you know, the autonomous smart contract. No, it's, it's somehow an active component, not so passive component, because in software architecture, and, 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 and uh, we have passive and active components, depending if we are talking about, uh, I would say, synchronous and asynchronous processes and, and so on. Uh, and interesting to say, uh, there's no requirement considering cryptocurrencies, because with, with networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, you need to own BTC, Bitcoin, or ETH, Ether, for example, in order to pay for a given transaction. But with Hyperledger, no. You just need to provision your network, deploy your smart contract, create the, the, the client applications, uh, and that can be an iOS or Android application or a web application, for example, uh, and that's it. Okay. As I said, it's managed uh, by the Linux Foundation. It follows the same governance model. Uh, there are several projects under this umbrella, um, but the main ones where we can uh, develop uh, Python clients, for example, uh, we have uh, Hyperledger Fabric and also Sawtooth. Okay. You can see uh, some projects here, you know, just to give you a glimpse of what I'm talking about, but I do invite you to visit uh, hyperledger.org and, and, and check yourself. Um, let's explain a little bit how a blockchain network uh, transaction works then. By the way, uh, the pointers that I have to source code here in the, in the, the Python and SDK, I'm talking about the client application here, you know, and where we have the Fabric SDK in light blue here and the keys, okay? Uh, and we have several components here. As I said, uh, blockchain network, for example, normally we have uh, several Docker containers, you know, and, and different nodes and peers that can process the transactions. So the client uh, enrolls in a transaction. This is actually a kind of authentication phase. And given that you are properly authenticated, you can propose uh, an endorsement for a transaction. You send it to a processing peer, you know, but this is actually an in-memory simulation. So you are not modifying the underlying databases yet. You know, you just uh, submit the data input. It goes to your smart contract. It runs your smart contract and the business logic in it, you know, and it validates the data input. In case everything is, is okay, it is returned and you receive what we call the read-write uh, set, you know, with the validation of that transaction. And then you can move to actually send a request to a component called the ordering service. You know, it's a kind of gatekeeper that controls and batches all the transactions. 
and then uh, the committer uh, node then will uh, it will be the, uh, the one that actually acts on the transaction bat. And at this moment, yes, we do have uh, the the transaction uh, persistence. You know, so it's effectively uh, written uh, to the underlying databases. And after that, there's a way to also implement a kind of callback. You know. Uh, and notify your client that the transaction was uh, somehow committed and confirmed. And this is useful, you know, maybe you want to send an email uh, message or maybe move a file, uh, uh, you know, and use FTP to um, maybe pro uh, do some kind of um, um, batch processing, for example, or maybe show a pop-up, um, but that's it, you know. So this is the basic flow. You can see this smart contract at the top here. This is actually uh, in Hyperledger we call it chain code, uh, but this is where you can implement the the cloud side or the back end side of your blockchain application. And the other, as, as, as I explained, is the client side, you know, uh, a mobile application or a web application. Let's have a quick demo here now. Um, let me see where it is. Yes. Uh, I have uh, created one blockchain network here uh, with Hyperledger. Um, okay. What's happening here? Mm. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, for example, just uh, uh, let's run one transaction here, uh, and I have, for example, what we call chain code, and I want to ch to, to to query the the state of a given contract. This is actually the simulation of a bank account. So, for example, uh, peer one, and 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 then for one party here, it has a balance of one hundred fifty, for example. Okay, and I can check then for 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 the same for for B, for example. Uh, let me query uh, B here now. Okay, uh, and you will see that we'll have, uh, actually I performed the transaction, sorry. Uh, a, B, invoke, query, B, invoke, query, A. Uh, so let me copy it here just one sec, please. Um, yes, uh, this one here. Yeah, let's query B here now, okay, uh, because I just want to show you the, the different balances here. Uh, one has 150, the other one 140. Okay, so then I can invoke a transaction to happen, and all those steps, you know, the authentication, the simul, the in-memory simulation, and all the nodes that will try to reach a consensus and validate the the, the data input, and also reach a consensus and return the read-write uh, set, for example. Uh, this will happen in the scope of an invoke transaction. The invoke transaction when you have CRUD. Uh, transactions, for example, with traditional transactions, you know, we have create, read, update, and delete. You know, normally read uh, transactions, uh, you don't need to demarcate them in the scope of uh, transactions. For example, this is an error, actually. I uh, I would say optimize several systems in my career because some people that de demarcate um, SQL select queries in the scope of transactions, and that creates so many uh, performance uh, issues, for example. Uh, I executed here one more transaction, and now I can, for example, uh, query uh, A again, and you will see that the balance will be a different one, you know? So this is just to provide you a glimpse of a blockchain, a real-world blockchain transaction. Uh, the good thing we, in Azure, we do have what we call managed blockchain. So uh, because blockchain is complex, we are talking about open source pro components, for example. So you have to work with, as I said, a typical blockchain network with just two, one founder and two participants, for example. Uh, you need 21 Docker containers, typically, you know, and you need to control all the IP addresses, certificates, ports, smart contracts, different and specific command line tools. So with Azure, we do have a dashboard where we consolidated all the information. You can see the transactions here, for example. Uh, this is a member node, but I, I can show you, for example, here, there are different ways that, uh, for example, you can create different nodes. This is one peer node, for example, the one that processes the transactions, and this is what we call the other node, you know, the one that belongs to a given network founder, for example, Honda, in my example. Uh, but let's proceed here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the development. Uh, considering Python, for example, Hyperledger Fabric, there's uh, an uh, unofficial uh, Python SDK that you can use to develop uh, client applications that will be able to talk with blockchain networks, you know. Uh, and we have the, a couple of different uh, resources here uh, on, on GitHub, you know, where you can get more information about uh, this SDK and also a tutorial. Uh, let me show you, for example, here um, the screen from where I can explain to you uh, the basic steps 
this is the project repository. You can see Hyperledger here. It belongs to hyperledger.org with all the steps here and how you can uh, stand up a, a, a blockchain network, for example, an example one. There are several steps here. So what you are seeing on Azure, for example, you need to perform some steps here to create the other node, for example, the certificate authority node and the peer nodes as well. You know the number of peers here. There are some configuration files uh, that you can use. Um, and then you have to install the Fabric SDK, start a network, you know, and with, with the peers, the other and the CA, as I said. Uh, there is something related to credentials and authentication here. There are several different, different ways that you can authenticate your client component, for example. But at the end of the day, what I want to show you here, uh, and of course, you can use what we call wallets as well, you know, security wallets. Uh, but this is one example how you can join a new channel, for example, and perform some transactions. And you can see here all the example code. You can instantiate in one client. You need a JSON file with the information about uh, your network and the security certificates. Uh, you can get that from um, uh, on Azure. You can download the admin credentials here and the connection profile. The connection profile is the actual JSON file that I was talking about. Okay. And... Yes, and you have several examples here as well that you can explore. As I said, I'm going to share this presentation with all the links um, today. Uh, please uh, do check our um, channel on, on, on Discord. Okay, But it's an easy step. You know, some imports here, uh, as usual. Uh, there's an async event loop here, and you instantiate the client with the proper configuration. And then you can start to, I would say, interact and perform some queries. For example, there's a sample here considering the uh, the responses and so on. So uh, please uh, make sure uh, to visit our Discord channel to get this information. Uh, I want to talk uh, a little bit more about uh, these smart contracts because unfortunately we don't have options yet to implement Python smart contracts, but only create client applications that can um, interact with blockchain networks. You know, so in the scope of Hyperledger blockchain, for example, we you can create smart contracts. You can use Java, GoLang. And, and JS and, and Node.js as the uh, smart contact language. I'm talking about the, the component where you implement the business logic and you deploy it to the cloud side, you know, the backend side. But uh, we do have an option, uh, the SDK that I've just talked about that you can use to actually extend or augment one existing Python application to add more security or the traceability or the things that I talked about, you know, and you can use that SDK. Uh, and you, of course, can also use the other languages. We have uh, Visual Studio Code. By the way, Microsoft has uh, one. Sorry, has one um, uh, extension for Visual Code specific to uh, blockchain uh, that you can also install. And, and there are other choices here. For example, my Medium blog. For example, in case you are interested in that, I have examples here with all the screenshots that you can use to deploy this uh, Kubernetes, this Hyperledger uh, uh, network on top of Kubernetes. For example, uh, there are pointers here to the, the GitHub examples for Hyperledger. The same thing with Quorum. There are several different protocols considering uh, blockchain. You know, Quorum is a different protocol, more aligned with Ethereum, you know, and you can see that the tool set here is totally different, but you can still use VS Code. And we have here the blockchain dev kit for Ethereum provided by Microsoft as well. Uh, by the way, uh, Quorum and Ethereum, they use a different uh, programming language called Solidity. It's a kind of DSL, you know, do domain specific language. It's actually a programming language, but it's quite specific to blockchain, you know, with several uh, things and data structures that are related to that. Um, some pointers here as well uh, in the blog posts that I talked about that you can check, you know, in case you want to explore that. The same thing with Corda. Corda is interesting. It's some people people say they, uh, that Corda is not a blockchain network, but actually uh, I consider it uh, as blockchain because at the end of the day, it's a Java framework uh, that uses security with several uh, implementations uh, and, and uses uh, underlying uh, relational databases as the data stores. And you can use uh, Java and Kotlin, you know, so it's totally JVM friendly here. Uh, so you can see uh, VS Code here as well, but you can also use Eclipse or IntelliJ. Um, several examples here as well. I have a couple of blog posts where I show how to run a, a Corda demo network in a test node. Uh, let's, let me talk a little bit about Azure uh, Heroes. Uh, it's one program that we have where we created several uh, blockchain-based uh, badges uh, that you can get. You know, by the way, I reserved 500 badges for you. Uh, they are lifelong ones, you know, so it's not like, for example, when you get a certification and let's say that the company 
uh, providing the, the, the badges for you uh, goes bankrupt, for example, so your badges will be gone? No, because these uh, blockchain badges, they are recorded on chain on Ethereum, so they will be there forever for you. They are lifelong badges, you know? And I reserved uh, 500 uh, learner badges, so make sure that uh, to visit our uh, channel on Discord, as I said, and get your badge as well. Let me talk a little bit now about uh, blockchain on Azure. As I said, uh, blockchain is, uh, is is complicated because uh, you need to, to, I would say, manage the entire um, deployment network, not only the smart contracts, you know, uh, and this IT governance is really complex in terms of IT infrastructure. Uh, you are working with open source, so you need to have this the proper security patching and things like that to avoid uh, the exploitation of security roles and so on. So that's why it's interesting to use a solution like what we have in Azure called Azure Blockchain Service. It's a managed solution, the, the, the dashboard that I showed you. Uh, we do have something called the, the blockchain workbench. Beyond the blockchain service, we also provision several Azure services out of the box for you. It's good for POCs and pilots. You know, so uh, you will also get, for example, IoT Hub. You, you will get Azure Active Directory for the security repository authentication and authorization and so on. And we do have the, the, the dev kit. The dev kit, I'm talking about the, the S code extension, but there are also several code samples on GitHub that you can leverage. Let's say that you want to send one SMS message and you want to use the Twilio API, for example, and control that uh, on blockchain, there's an example there for you, okay? Uh, so we have the dev kit, uh, the examples that I talked about on GitHub. So the key takeaways here, you know, uh, Azure is a very good uh, blockchain platform because it's not a, the, some some other cloud players. They only have Hyperledger Fabric, for example. No, we do have Ethereum. We have Corda. We, we have uh, several other protocols. We have Hyperledger Fabric and so on. So you have choice here. It's a managed platform. Um, simplification, of course, because uh, when you abstract all this complexity, considering the, the IT governance and the infrastructure, for example, you can just focus on create, creating your client applications, as I explained, the smart contract, and that's it. You have a full blockchain application ready for you. Okay, so you can, of course, start from scratch and create a new blockchain application, or maybe you can extend an existing Java application, Golang application, uh, Node.js one, or even Python application, for example, okay? And this is just a glimpse of the workbench that I talked about. You can see the gateway service here for IP, API management and uh, IoT Hub, for example, Active Directory here, several different components along with uh, the uh, Azure blockchain service here, right? So it's worth uh, having a look at it. Uh, the governance, I talked about it. So that's it, my presentation. Uh, there's just one more thing that I would like to, to show you here. I have one more example here. It's a different protocol, of course. Uh, it's Solidity, you can see the extension here, that's all, you know, so it's just a simple smart contract. But you can see uh, with the blockchain, uh, the, the blockchain extension for VS Code, for example, how easy it is to create blockchain applications uh, with uh, VS Code and Azure, of course, you know. I'm connected here, you know, uh, I'm connected to, to that blockchain network that I just showed you, you know, so you can manage all the, your transactions here and your connections. And, and for example, it's easy if, because I don't need to run several command line tools with several arguments. For example, I can just right click here and, and, and for example, uh, click build contract and you will see that I can build uh, my smart contract, you know, uh, easily. And then I can also deploy it. Uh, I can also run maybe one transaction and show you this um, network in action here. Uh, one more, um, one more uh, quick demo here, for example, I have to connect to this blo blockchain network. Okay, that's running on Azure as well. Uh, that's a kind of shell here, and that's what I'm doing now. I'm connecting to that blockchain network. You can see that the, this ID here is actually what I have here in this configuration file here, okay, on, 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 on VS Code. Uh, and then I can just move to execute some transactions, you know. So first, let's read and, and check what we have there at the moment recorded on chain, um, for example. Okay, so you can see, hello, pajamas, blah, blah, blah. Um, Let's maybe change this message here and say something like, hello, um, Pythonistas. Um, yes, something like that, okay? Uh, and then I can run this transaction. So I'm going to modify, actually create a new block, okay? And append it to, 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 to the blockchain. Um, sorry, okay, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, it takes some time uh, uh, to reflect, but I think 
given the number of nodes that I have, we can check now again. Yes, so it's modified. So it's one more example. And you, for example, we've just deployed this math contract, right? I compiled, but I can also deploy it from here, you know? So I just right click again and I click deploy smart contracts and you can see here uh, that the, 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 the deployment, I select the target network here, okay? And the deployment starts. Um, and but, well, that's it. Uh, that's everything that I have for you today. So as I said, make sure that you scan uh, the QR code so you can get the free uh, courses that we have at Microsoft Learn. And also make sure the, to visit our channel on Discord to get this presentation with all the links and also the, the, the Azure Heroes uh, blockchain badgers and uh, of course the, the free courses uh, that we, I've just talked about, okay? Thank you very much. And that's everything. So uh, in case you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them now. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, if, uh, yeah, if you have questions, uh, you can actually find uh, Shores uh, at uh, Discord and there's the Microsoft channel. Make sure you check it out. There's a lot of good things like free courses and all these things for you. So make sure you check it out. So actually uh, this stream is about to finish. Oh, I will let Horace go. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> so yeah, this stream is about to finish. Uh, we will start our next stream. Uh, actually it's the next one on the pay playlist. So if you uh, have follow us and if you have you're watching us on the playlist then uh, you should go to the next one in a few minutes so uh, last thing to end uh, i will just play uh the the message from microsoft because uh, they are awesome uh and then i would see you actually martin will see you in the next stream so take a break uh, have a nap if you want to or have some hot chocolate and see you there <laughs>